start, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome to ICON 2018. This is a conference which is held every two years by the Indus Hospital. Multi-speciality conference and this is the cardiology session. I'll uh, request the panelists to come up. Uh, Nadeem, Dr. Nadeem Kamar, Professor Nadeem Kamar. He is uh, the Executive Director of National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. Uh, next is uh, Professor Fawad Kazmi, who is the Chief of Cardiology at uh, Aarhan University Hospital. Professor Asadullah Kundi is uh, with us at uh, Indus Hospital, who is the ex Executive Director of National Institute of Cardiovascular Disease. And uh, Dr. Asad Patan. Asad is uh, Chief of Cardiology at the Hospital. <laughs> this is uh, going to be uh, almost a three hour session, so just uh, stay awake. What we have done is try to make the presentation as brief as possible, 15 minutes, and then there would be uh, five minutes for the discussion. So it's going to be a 15 minutes talk. The speakers are requested to limit their talk to 15 minutes because after that the slides will dissolve and then you have five minutes for discussion. So you really have to curtail with that. Um, and uh, in between the two sessions we have a coffee break for 10-15 minutes, coffee and prayers. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Imran Ahmed. Dr. Imran Ahmed is a, uh, is a, is a cardiologist at uh, Ziaudin Hospital. Dr. Imran will be talking about the uh, evaluation and management of hypertension according to the current guidelines published this year. So, Dr. Imran, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sadiq, for the introduction and invitation, Allah. Yeah. <clears throat> we share a bit of interest in Vyaldin as well, because Sadiq is there as a part-timer. So he comes. That's fine. I'll manage. I know how to run it. I made it. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, I'm Dr. Ahmed, uh, fellow of Royal College at London. So, a lot of friends sitting here, Kava and myself were together at AKU as faculty many, many years ago. And then other faces, friends, fellow travelers actually for most meetings. The idea was to talk on management with the new guidelines. I thought guidelines are so confusing and every few months you're standing up cutting a sorry figure and trying to explain what was wrong in the last guideline and what's so good about the new one. But some, some, some guidelines are exceptions, like the JNC-8 guidelines. Most of us, I don't say all, but most of us hated it for good reasons, right? But the new guidelines, again, is a complete swing of pendulum. I'm not going to bore you with one slide after the other of the guidelines, but I would rather talk on why guidelines are made and why we keep changing it. So let's, because the time is so critical and the chopping machine is on, so I'd rather just quickly start with something. Do, do we have a pointer? Because that will help me a lot. Uh, this is saying of one of the wisest persons ever lived on earth. At his time, he was, it was said that he's the wisest man. There's nobody wiser than Socrates. What Socrates, Socrates, what he said, he didn't say, I don't think I know what I know. He said, I don't think I know what I don't know. It's a very profound concept, and there are books written on it. What did he mean? It's called internal discovery. Socrates de depended a lot on what's called internal discoveries. I think the nearest translation in our language would be ilham. Ideas occurring in your mind or your heart, whatever you believe. For, for instance, this is a great internal discovery that wealth doesn't break goodness. But it's the goodness which brings everything including wealth. So if you are good, things will come to you. And one of the internal discoveries is that in one of those things is actually health. So, I mean, very profound concepts. It's just to wake you up. Because after lunch, you, you can be a bit of drowsy. So, 
I'm going to dip now in the deep end of the pool, hypertension. We used to take it as a hemodynamic stress primarily. Blood pressure is after all pressure. It's force per unit area, the good old A-level style physics, you know, force per unit area. But what is important is this, an epidemial function. So if you, are, if, you, if you want to make guidelines, we are making guidelines how to improve the endothelial function. This is the largest endocrine body. Of course you all know very familiar faces, senior colleagues, um, um, students from Ziauddin, now at NICVD, the other places, they know everything about the hard risk factors, specific groups, diabetics, um, isolated systolic hypertension and all. This is proverbial finger in all pies, you will agree that hypertension means every business that you do in the hospital, from gynecology to surgery to every field of medicine. This is the list of your patients in any day on your outpatient clinic. I bet you, if anybody is not in this group, it probably doesn't need to see you, right? So hypertension has got fingers in everything. This is a very famous, very old slide. This is from Kaplan. You know kaplan Meyer curve? The, those who are inclined towards their statistics. Kaplan made this very important and very eye-opener concept, is that people with hypertension have other risks, not just the major risk, but other things, like hyperinsulinemia, remember? 20 years ago, hyperinsulinemia, a major risk for hypertension. ACE inhibitors coming up, captopril, getting all the praise. This is, this is it. Idea is not to bore you, is to give you this insight that hypertension is not that boring. It's not just the pressure that you measure there. There's something more to it. And if you want to make it, this is the single most common killer of the mankind. Do you know that? If you put the weightage list, WHO, number one is actually hypertension. Number two is smoking. Cigarette smoking or tobacco smoking is number two. And then various other grades. Very famous slides, uh, Kazelbash and the group, but normally given the credit to Lowington and the group, Kazelbash and the group actually looked into it about this thing. And this is like a census, it's like 13 million person here. A 13 million person here data is something you will never challenge, never do again. So we know about that, this <coughs> meta-analysis. And this is the relationship. This was, by the way, the first strong data associating hypertension to coronary disease and that explains how confused we are and we don't know is what we don't know, right? So admission of <coughs> ignorance is not that bad after all. Okay, this is the guideline which made a lot of sense and it's still Europeans believe that. The last 2013 ESC guidelines, the ESH guidelines, is still talking of those numbers and high-risk groups treating slightly differently. Actually, that's what I meant. The pendulum has come back to it. I don't have time to spend on it. But JNC7, mind you, if you want to take one guideline seriously, this is JNC7, talking of hypertension. And remember these numbers, and you will know that there is nothing new in the new guideline. Because when you calculate the risk, there is a risk calculator in the new guideline, and you come to the same conclusion, isn't it? I'll show you. Well. British people take this lead for National Institute of Care Excellence. Remember, we, are, we love beta blockers, and beta blocker got this big, well, a real bad treatment in hand of nice guideline for hypertension. But again, I bet cardiologists, how many patients do you see who don't have heart failure or coronary disease or tachycardia or some sort of arrhythmias or symptomatic ectopics or whatever? where you can, you, you can do without a beta blocker. So a beta blocker has always got compelling indication. This is my bias, right? This is not the guideline. The guideline says beta blocker is right there. And it is there. I mean, if, if you see a pure hypertension, it is there. This is JNC8. I keep showing this. My friends know it. Your, uh, this meeting here in uh, Pakistan Khalid Society, Pakistan Hypertension League, this is the demolition job. Whatever we did for all these years, preaching our students, ourselves, most of us ourselves, how important it is to bring the number down, and it's not important. Because you can, you can really go up to 150 in the age of 60. Remember, 60 in Europe and North America is not old. Not old at all, right? Even in Pakistan, now whatever you say, your, ex your average life expectancy is twice 
the number which it was in 1947 when Pakistan was made. Right? So, lots of surprises there. Some of you would remember James E. and how it was preached. We always say it. Unfortunately, within a year or a year and a quarter, American Heart Association meeting showed a new data called SPRINT data. Remember this word, SPRINT, right? <coughs> and what it showed was that if you bring the blood pressure down further, and you know the comparison in SPRINT is between the blood pressure, the baseline goes 136 systolic average. 136, which is ideal, less than 140. And comparing it to less than 120, remember, this data has no diabetes in it. And this is a very important point to remember. In the sprint, no diabetes. That's an exclusion criteria. So these are risky patients, of course, smokers, coronary patients, and others, but no diabetes. So sprint gave you this idea, but a few weeks ago, actually in this beautiful Orange County area of Southern California, what you learned is a complete 360 degree turn, not 180 but 360. We went back to JLC7, but in a very different manner. What you showed in the American Heart Association guideline is that the definition of hypertension has changed. Now this is a bit of a bombshell, isn't it? This is a bombshell because Washington Post not medical journals. Washington Post, Los Angeles Times mentioned the definition of blood pressure has changed. And this is their lead story because hypertension is so common. 130, that's the word, that's the phrase used. 130 is the new 140, whatever that means. 130 is the new 140. 140 was sticking with us, but not anymore. 130. But how does it affect? And, uh, and remember, it's not just ACC and AHA. I was given this task to talk on that. But there's more to it. There's the American Association of Family Medicine, Chess Physicians, American Association of Physicians, and lots of other people. The idea was these five, uh, these four areas, sorry, these four areas were important. They were like self-directed monitoring is common in our life now. Patients come and talk to you about their home monitoring. You ask them to get ABPM. So it's a different time we are living in. Our office ka number Joby ho. If patient comes back and gives you a list of numbers, they are after all written numbers. The written number has got the problem. The target, that's the big issue. The threshold may be different, but what is the target? Where to bring it down to? The comparative benefit is important to reach a certain place. But how to reach there is also important. You can reach a certain place, but which part do you take? This is important. And then, of course, the combination, monotherapy, fixed dose combination. Remember, these are the four main areas. I am assimilating the guidelines for you. I'm not showing you the guidelines slide one after the other. I, I, I will not do it. I can't do it in 15 minutes either. And it will be, I, I can assure you, it will be very boring. But these are the five main points. And if I can pass that on to the young faces sitting here, this is how the guidelines were changed. The emphasis on blood pressure measurement was there. I recommend all of you is a big document to read up recording of blood pressure and how important it is. Not just the office number, the number at home, the number in ambulatory BPM, ABPM, the new blood pressure classification, as I just said, the lower target for in, in management of hypertension, and that the complete new approach, the lifestyle approach and things. It was always there. In fact, James the five was the first guideline which mentioned about global risk reduction. That's the first time the phrase was used, global risk reduction. But that's always been there, but it's paid, made part and parcel in this guideline. And this is the key slide. And the message is there is no blood pressure new number after 140-90. And that's, a, that's, a, that's even a bigger news for me than 130 being the new 140. <coughs> Look here. And remember, there's no JNC8 here. JNC8 is not even mentioned. It's like an aberration. Forget it. So normal BP remains the same, less than 120 80. You, you remember pre-hypertension from JNC7? Pre-hypertension, that between 120 and 140. So what you are getting is the lower 10 millimeter is given into high normal or elevated blood pressure, but not hypertension. Slightly different. You can uh, slide like in England, we use right high normal BP 
sort of thing. And the top 10 is now the beginning of hypertension. So this is hypertension stage 1. And stage 1, mind you, is under 140, 90. And now this is a bigger story. It's not only that 130 starts it off, but that's the end of stage 1. And after that, everything is stage 2. So we all know how many blood pressure we have to do until now, it's all stage 2. Stage 3 was not before. You have to know that you have to say stage, ग्रेड का है यूरोपियन स्टाइल में, but there is grade one, grade two, stage one, stage two, लेकिन अब स्टेज टू ही सब कुछ स्टेज टू है जो पहले होता था, right? अब इस और स्टेज वन बेसिकली प्री हाइपरटेंशन, अब इसका फायदा क्या हुआ ये सब करने का? प्री हाइपरटेंशन तो पहले भी था, फायदा ये हुआ कि उस प्री हाइपरटेंशन में से जो हाई रिस्क एविडेंस बेस, because of the risk of dying, heart attacks, strokes, myocardial infarctions, deaths, arrhythmia, sudden death, उनको अलग कर दिया, उनको हाइपरटेंशन कह दिया, but then you don't start medicine immediately. What you do, you you use, well, I'm sorry, but there is a system there called risk calculator. Unfortunately, we hate that. जो हम लोग इतने एक्सपीरियंस हैं, हमें क्या जरूरत है रिस्क कैलकुलेट करने की? But unfortunately, risk calculate करना पड़ेगा, so that in fact, this sprint or record has changed. I don't have time to tell you about the record. The record is phenomenal. There is a diabetic study, but there is a lot of stress in cardiology. This is the key slide. Now, see the specific comorbidities. Look there. 1380 is all targeted. All. You can argue that this stroke is different. Why? But this stroke is different. The target is different. The target is different. Right? This is very important message. So all these people have got the 10-year risk which is more than 10%. If you have a 10-year risk of more than 10% of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or SCVD, then you treat as hypertension with medicine. Otherwise, you treat with lifestyle change, salt reduction. So you have to say that you have to say that you have diabetes, yes, chronic kidney disease, yes, treat at 130, treat at 130. So now you have got more evidence for that, okay? So this was basic. I mean, it can be, it can be, I mean, two, three minutes which I have just picked up, this level of evidence which is A and this is, this is class of recommendation one. So it's a one A recommendation. One A recommendation, wait, you can use any of that, right? Again, diuretic, class one drug. One A indication. You use diuretic, calcium blockers, which I use for compelling indication. Now this is the combination therapy. Yeah, Pariye, Guru. Of course, I know senior people know everything about that, but I think our junior colleagues need that degree of emphasis on that, of combination. Which medicine to combine with which, and where to start a combination treatment with level of evidence one. Oh, sorry, the the, the class of recommendation one of one. And, and this is evidence, and th there's a very complicated system of CEO, not, not that CEO, but a slightly different CEO. And then this fixed combinations. But now, this is very important, follow up. Hum kya karte hai? Dawa change kiya. I'll see you in three months' time. We are so busy, but we have to have a system of follow up. And the class one recommendation, one B recommendation, is follow up four weeks if you change any medicine. If you change any medicine to control BP, I've only picked up the changes and how it is going to affect you. Actually, it's going to affect you very badly. The implications are global. The prevalence has changed. The sprint equivalent is a new term. We are living in a period called a sprint equivalent period. So now we cannot deny the fact that hypertension is a big killer. We always believe that. Silent killer, all right, but a bad killer. Silent and bad. And then restaging hypertension has got a lot of implication on epidemiology, on health costs and everything. You see? So, I, I'm, I'm just finishing with my last slide here, so before the chopper works on me. Uh, controlling blood pressure, this is with JNC5, when the global risk reduction was used. This is Elliot, an editorial. And what it says, because it's a quote, so please permit me to read it, because this is a quotation. What he says, quote, controlling blood pressure with medication is unquestionably one of the most cost-effective methods of reducing premature cardiovascular morbidity and mortality, unquote. Can't, things can't be simpler than that. So if you want to cut down premature mortality, you have to control blood pressure with medicines. 
And this, all these guidelines are what Socrates told you before Christ. I dedicate my talk. There is no declaration of uh, conflicts here. It's just my family. We died last January, actually. Actually, almost to the date in January. Um, with good snowfall in Burban. Um, thank you very much, and thanks, Sajid, again. But I don't know if there are question session is now, right? Okay. Right and now. Maybe it's, uh, you should have labeled this. As hypertension guidelines made ridiculously simple. Yes, <laughs> it looks simple, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. I'm sure there must be questions. Any questions? Okay. Uh, say, I mean, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it, you, you said that GNC8 was an aberration. But even on uh, the new, that, yeah. yeah, even in the new, new guidelines, I mean, there's probably uh, more non-acceptance or controversy than was on G GNC8. Uh, even in within US, you have mentioned our no. family physician, and they have refused to accept it. Yeah, yeah. You see, that's what I said. The pendulum has moved completely, it swung to the other end. I, I believe the JMC 8 was in that end, and this guideline, this is, remember, it's not Joint National Committee guidelines. And, and ACC and AHA normally don't intervene in it. Those of you who actually work in the United States, they know very well that Heart, Lung, Blood Institute has got this explicit committee, the National Heart, Lung, Blood Institute, this Joint National Committee for Evaluation, Education, whatever, you see. And this is not that committee, because that committee, for reasons which are beyond scientific reasons, before Joint National Committee's eighth report, was dissolved, and, and in for almost an infight there. So Joint National Committee's eighth report was never accepted even by Joint National Committee's hardline supporters. I remember ACT meetings and AG meetings, and there was always this big debate. And after the sprint, the time was getting even shorter for GNCA to move out. I know there would always be newer guidelines coming up. If you ask my opinion, and I'll take the opportunity to answer that, I take uh, the European Society's 2013 guidelines, or, J or, or, or NICE, 2011 guidelines where ambulatory BP came into the picture as the most sane guidelines, most GP friendly guidelines, physician friendly, even cardiologist friendly. Yes, sir. editorial about GNC or it was not approved by actually GNC. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Joint National Committee's members were not happy with that publication. It and it took, it took actually four or five extra years to publish it. Actually, yes. in black and white, they published it in general. This is because of my very um, uh, well black interest in it, actually, because of the ACA shook me to my core. Can I just make one? Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I think this was published about 10 years ago. I think everybody is familiar with that. Uh, they had surveyed a thousand physicians in Pakistan, and the uh, hypertensive of choice was a benzodiazepine. Uh, and I'm very sure that we haven't moved too far, far from that. No, I mean, so maybe so that's My there. point is that perhaps in Pakistan, talking about these guidelines, yes. is, is it may be irrelevant. There's a lot more groundwork that needs to be done before we even get close to talking yeah, about this. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 beta the blockers, I think after benzos, <coughs> a beta blockers are the drug of second choice. So yes. I think yes. it's an embarrassing state of affairs. Yes. Uh, if not 50%, I'm sure it's still close to that. Uh, so uh, benzos, we, we all benzos. see it in our practice. Uh, sir, the principal, uh, relevant points, I fully agree with you. That maybe the only change is not diazepam, it's is bromazepam. So <laughs> there was some change in it. Like it, that this is the reason. I, I, when I was given this task to talk on AHAACC, you see. If I were given a task to talk on blood pressure guidelines as such, then I would have talked on European guidelines. Um, I have this near Atlantic side biases as well. But yeah. Actually, uh, one important thing for uh, yes, the young uh, 
positions. Um, in my observation, I think only few, maybe about 10% uh, of the physician and nurse know how to uh, measure blood pressure correctly. That's right. I think That's we right. should uh, yes. Uh, yes, teach them. Important they should learn, see, measurement of blood I pressure. This is very always important. in the guideline. Gain C, Jovi guideline, you try, it starts with measurement of BB. Like in a nurse, in, this guideline now has got a big proportion dedicated to it. Because this is uh, essentially not a JNC guideline. That's a different guideline. It's a consensus. They believe it's a consensus, but Howard is absolutely right. There's no consensus. And there are editorial after the editorial against this one as well. Yeah. But the sprint about Bahal change okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure hypertension today there must be a lot of questions. We'll move on to our next presenter, Dr. Faria Sadiq. Dr. Faria is an electrophysiologist at the Bar Hospital and she'll be talking about current uh, challenges in AFib and preventing stroke. Assalamu alaikum everyone and uh, thank you very much to 2018 Organizing Committee and Dr. Thakam for uh, giving me an opportunity to present on this forum. It's indeed an honor for me. Um, I can stand here and talk on atrial fibrillation management for hours, but unfortunately I've only been given 15 minutes for this. And uh, so I will not uh, talk about in detail what uh, the guideline says about this and that, I'm going to talk about um, what challenges as we cardiologists and electrophysiologists face when we see patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, stressing more on why AF is important and uh, what risk stratification scheme do we use to clearly identify a high risk group. Uh, less talked about uh, device detect atrial arrhythmia, but it's very important the subclinical arrhythmias that we see. And uh, moving on to the uh, diagnosing um, the etiology of cryptogenic stroke and um, and how do we do that? And uh, in the in, in the last, I'll talk about briefly about the LA closure devices. So, what's the challenge number one? Uh, we don't have sufficient detection and diagnostic strategies to label anyone with atrial fibrillation, and. Um, and if we do not have effective diagnostic and detection techniques, uh, we will miss uh, about a third to a half of patients who get affected with stroke and the only time we will see them is when they have suffered a stroke and, uh, and we've actually missed the opportunity to, uh, to treat them and give them the benefit. Uh, a lot of said and proposed about routine health screening uh, by the general physicians, the family doctors, the internists. And, uh, and I think this is the basis of, um, you know, this is the first step in, in, in the detection. Um, the second step is public <coughs> education and giving them uh, the understanding of, uh, uh, of seeking medical advice if an irregular pulse is detected. ECG is the most cost effective way of uh, detecting uh, atrial fibrillation, but it does come with an additional cost. And routine pulse screening uh, is uh, is the first thing. Um, and not just not just that the ECG has some cost to it, but um, the there's a limitation in the ECG interpretation by the by the physicians in the community, the nurse practitioners. <coughs> so we're still struggling with detecting and uh, diagnosing uh, atrial fibrillation. The second challenge that we face is uh, low patient awareness and understanding. Patients who have AFib, they have very poor understanding of, it, of what atrial fibrillation is and what and how it, it impacts on the quality and the quantity of life. And they're not even aware of what treatments they're taking and why are they taking these treatments. And we know from the international surveys and studies that Patients with atrial fibrillation, about one third of them not even aware that they have AFib. About 50% of patients, they don't know why they're taking blood thinners. And, um, and they don't even know that they are at risk of having clots and that can cause stroke. 60% of patients feel that their underlying condition is not severe. So there's a great need to educate patients um, and uh, involving them in the decision making when we talk about uh, uh, stroke prevention. 
And now, incomplete knowledge among the healthcare professional is the biggest challenge. We stress so much on patient education, but we will never be able to engage patients in making, uh, management, making decisions and targeting their management unless we educate our healthcare professionals and equip them with high knowledge on this condition. We know that the root cause for poor guideline adherence is that there, uh, there is this uh, idea in the mind that they always underestimate the benefit of, uh, of the medication and overestimate the risk of oral anticoagulation. There's a lot of um, overestimation of the safety of aspirin and its effectiveness uh, in stroke prevention. So we urgently and desperately need to improve awareness and understanding among the physicians uh, educate them of the existing antithrombotic treatments, take the fear off them, uh, um, give them education on the availability of the newer oral anticoagulation where we don't really have to monitor the INRs. We have to educate them about the proper dosing for stroke prevention. Now changing gears, and we've talked about the challenges, why does atrial fibrillation matter in preventing stroke? And we all know that the most common risk factor for ischemic stroke, about 50%, is atrial fibrillation. The burden of, it's not just the burden of stroke, it's, um, and the uh, increased risk of stroke, it's the burden of stroke as well. And patients who uh, suffer stroke with atrial fibrillation as etiology, uh, the strokes are more severe, they're frequently fatal, they likely lead to, to disability, increased healthcare cost, and unhospital care than patients who do not have AFib uh, as an etiology of stroke. And this slide uh, clearly says that there's about two times risk of dying, both at 30 day and at one year, if patients have stroke with atrial fibrillation. Now, we need to identify uh, these patients who are at risk of stroke, and we have two schemas, CHAS and chas -VAS. However, the current guidelines um, focus mainly or, or emphasize on using chas -VASC, uh to, uh, to uh, risk stratify because patients with a low chas -VASC or chas -VASC zero are truly low risk uh, group and the rest are uh, high risk and need stroke prevention. This slide actually uh, shows why um, chas -VASC has importance um, in redefining the uh, stroke risk is because uh, even patients who have CHAD zero, uh, their stroke risk exponentially increases if the CHAD VASC is one or higher. So only true low risk group is the CHAD VASC zero uh, group. I'm not going to go into uh, the, uh, the 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 CHAD and the CHAD VASC scoring system, um, but I'm going to talk about uh, the. Is it 15 minutes over? <laughs> okay. So the next question that I keep asking myself is what do I do or what physicians should do when they detect uh, atrial fibrillation um, uh, on, de on devices? And these devices could be um, external monitors, holter monitors, the ventricles, ECGs. But um, with the implantable devices, including the dual chamber ICDs, pacemakers, the CRT, and the ventricular leads with atrial sensing. So what do we do when we see um, atrial high rate episodes on these <coughs> devices? So uh, the only clinical implication of these subclinical uh, arrhythmias is anticoagulation for stroke prevention. Um, but it is very important to review the intracardiacs to verify diagnostic accuracy because although most of these atrial hybrid episodes detected by the device are atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, but they can be false detection or of far field over sensing and runs of premature atrial complexes. So it's, it's our responsibility to review the intracardiacs and if needed, um, uh, stroke prevention. Then the question is, how much silent AF is too much? And uh, what duration is long enough before we can actually implement stroke prevention strategies? Very unfortunately, there are no specific recommendations by the current guidelines. 
We talk so much about uh, device-detected AF, but no specific guidelines. The three trials, the three important trials that give us some clue of what uh, and how much is important is the first one um, that was published in 2002 used a cut of 10 consecutive beats. This was a retrospective study and it clearly showed that patients who had atrial high rate episodes and they had sinus node dysfunction and they had pacemakers, they were likely to have die more than patients who didn't have atrial high rate episodes and they have a higher risk of developing fibrillation, atrial fibrillation and so. So <coughs> atrial high rate episodes and the cutoff of 10 consecutive weeks. The second trial that came in and helped us was the trend was published in 2009 and which showed that um, whether it was a low burden or a high burden, the risk of stroke increased exponentially if somebody had uh, risk factors for stroke and detected atrial high rate episodes on, on the device. The final trial that came in 2012 actually had a, the shortest cutoff of only six minutes to diagnose atrial fibrillation with an atrial rate of 190 beats per minute. And this trial, this, was, this showed that there was increased risk of ischemic stroke if uh, atrial high rate episodes, the true atrial high rate uh, episodes detected for six minutes or longer, and the incremental stroke risk uh, with the longer episodes. So the time is now to prevent stroke in patients with asymptomatic AF because time is brain. Now, changing gears, but before I um, move on, I just want to share this uh, article which was uh, which utilized 12 lead ECG and a specific PVIF morphology called it Advanced Interatrial Block. This uh, article was a, uh, was a support from my colleagues in Canada, um, and we and and this and, the, uh, um, and this was based on detection of atrial fibrillation in, this, in cardiac resynchronization devices. So, and we saw that just using the specific PVIF morphology of, on a 12 lead ECG. 62% patients who had this specific advanced interatrial block on, on the ECG developed atrial fibrillation on follow-up. Um, clearly that uh, we can still uh, identify uh, patients with who will develop atrial fibrillation and this is a very basic tool and above uh, conventional risk factors. So advanced interatrial block is a specific P wave morphology on the 12 lead ECG. So if you see this morphology, which is a five basic P wave uh, and longer P wave duration on lead 2, 3, and ABF, which, is, uh, which suggests a delayed and or sh um, absent conduction to the Bachman bundle is a risk predictor for uh, new onset atrial fibrillation. Now, what, how do we uh, manage or uh, um, investigate patients who come um, uh, with stroke? And they are stroke survivors, right? And we all know that um, there is a very poor understanding between the temporal relationship of atrial fibrillation and stroke, and uh, the episodes of AFib are not detected until months after stroke. So the role of intracardiac monitors or the implantable devices are, is huge. Um, Crystal AF, which was uh, an ICM um, uh, study published in 2014, uh, showed that there was an exponential benefit of implanting uh, ICM in patients well, with stroke, and uh, at six months and at three years, there was higher detection rate with ICMs compared to conventional ECG group. So now my final uh, uh, slide, why and when to close the left atrial appendage. Um, we all know that stroke in patients with non-valvular AF is largely due to the um, thromboembolic source in the left atrial appendage. In the valvular AF that we see a lot more common have a thrombus in uh, both the atrial body and the appendage. So we know that who have non-valvular AF, they have a high risk of stroke. These patients can be considered for closure devices if they have contraindication to oral anticoagulation, if they have high risk of bleeding uh, with the drugs, uh, difficult to maintain INR within the therapeutic range, or they, these patients are poorly compliant or, uh, or logistic problems in us for maintaining a proper INR. So Watchman uh, was the only is the only uh, FDA approved device uh, was uh, mar in March 2015. Protect AF was a study uh, funded by Boston, and this uh, study showed that uh, Watchman was non inferior uh, for all strokes, however superior for hemorrhagic stroke prevention 
and not inferior to from mortality rate. The concerns were mainly early safety adverse event, uh, events, especially pericardial effusion and tamponade, and with time, with the learning curve, this is getting better. There was some concern about stroke, residual leak, and vascular complications. However, um, this is getting better, and we've got good data from the European centers. And this is um, how the Watchman device looks like. Um, a, a 12 French sheet is needed with help of transesophageal um, echo and angiography. The, the, the device is implanted with uh, only 45 days of chromatin needed post uh, implant. So in summary, um, we need to emphasize both uh, on patient and healthcare professional education to prevent a stroke, um, and truly low child's vast group are the only true low, low risk group in, in, the, in, in this. Anticoagulation for stroke prevention is, is, uh, should be based on their risk assessment, uh, and it doesn't matter whether the AF is paroxysmal, persistent, whether the patients are symptomatic or they have subclinical arrhythmias. Intracardic monitors are, are exponential a benefit for extended monitoring, especially in cryptogenic strokes. The Watchman is the only uh, FDA-approved device with consistent efficacy and safety. However, it only addresses uh, cardiovascular events from left atrial appendage. Thank you. mentioned aspirin, but I think you, I'm sure every, all of us have seen the, in, in wage practice in Pakistan, uh, aspirin and sulfidogrel combination is supposed to be as effective as anticoagulation in that. <coughs> and I think uh, data would support that that's a big myth. Uh, the bleeding risk is no different from Coumadin. Uh, in fact, most of these patients get put on duodenticlately because they perceive to have a high leading with risk with ball friends. I think that's just to re-emphasize the point you made. Um, I guess the other point was about atrial flutter. I think the embolic risk would be no different from atrial fibrillation. And, and probably the same recommendation would uh, would come up. And my question is is really about incidental device detected arrhythmias. Uh, you know, I mean, you clearly brought out some evidence, but uh, you know, rates more than 190 or 220, uh, that would be uh, less common. I think we see, you know, atrial fibrillation at a slower rate. What I find difficult in practice is my patients who have low EF and are already on a ton of medications to reduce their heart rate. When they come into clinic with incidental EF, it's really difficult to pick up. They, they usually have their heart rates in 60s and 70s mm -hmm. and to detect that subtle uh, irregularities without an EKG can be difficult at times. So I, I guess that's still uh, confusing. Yeah. When to start treatment for device detected AF? Okay, so thank you so very much. Yes, I, uh, I really appreciate your uh, comments on emphasizing uh, to take away the fear from the prof health professionals of use of oral anticoagulation for stroke prevention because combination of aspirin and clopidogrel is no good either and it has no additional benefit similar bleeding risk to comodin and aspirin is no good uh, in high risk patients. Um, the other thing that I want to uh, emphasize is the device detected arrhythmias are, um, are, are, uh, should be reviewed by the physician who is able to review uh, the, uh, the intracardiac, but the rate of 180, 190, 200 are the atrial high rates. So the device which if have two leads, atrial and ventricle, would be able to pick up the atrial rate, uh, which is uh, more than 190 or 200 beats per minute, is classically is atrial fibrillation. So it's the atrial rate and not the ventricular rate, so atrial high rate episode. Um, and then the, the next question was, you know, uh, patients come in with a slower rate and they would not be able to diagnose whether they have um, atrial fibrillation or not. So if, you know, checking the pulse and if it's irregular or bring an ECG, that, that comes in next. So, and, and the, the most important thing that I uh, do when I see patients with, uh, with devices, especially if I talk about ICDs and CRTs, they're patients who already have a high risk of developing atrial fibrillation. And if you uh, remember the, the slide that I showed, was an original article published from Canadian 
University on use of um, uh, B-wave morphology. And uh, we saw that in, in that group of patients who were, begin with, to begin with high risk group, high uh, heart failure patients, cardiomyopathy, on C with CRT, they developed, 30% uh, of developed atrial fibrillation within 12 months without prior history of AFib. So, and this was only based on detection by the devices. Uh, so can, yeah, sorry, can, can I make a comment here, perhaps sharing my frustration, if uh, not a question? Uh, patients for, uh, uh, this is very important, the, the fear of um, NOACs or DOACs should not be there in physicians' mind. But the thing is, there's been all these generics available in NOAC area. I'm, I'm not too bothered if it is Marivan or some generic warfarin, because I, I would know eventually, in a, in a week time or a month's time, what to do about this medicine. But with non-availability of my factor 10A activity assay, and if I'm using one of these generics, uh, uh, NOAC, what to do? I mean, whether I can use it or not. I am very, very afraid of using it. Uh, let me add to that. Uh, we uh, recently did a small study at Tampa, uh, you know, crossover study. We got kids who uh, uh, were rivaroxaban levels and factor 10A activity. I won't name the generic. And, and the numbers came out actually in favor of the branded drug. Uh, we, we are actually ending up redoing the study and getting another kit, but I think it, it's food for thought and I totally yeah, agree I with you that at least with, with warfarin you can monitor in some way and we shouldn't put our full trust in the uh, non-branded rivaroxaban just like we would do with Toronto. So I, I, I think uh, there is some weightage to what you're saying. So. Uh, uh, yes, I do agree that um, you know the non-patent drugs are nowhere to be trusted. So what we're talking about is the patent drug. Obviously, it's a cost. Uh, the antidote for uh, the, the the newer oral anticoagulation are are in pipeline. But all these studies on rivaroxaban, apixaban, uh, and all and the other newer oral anticoagulation have shown that a very small number of patients will require an antidote in case of uh, uh, severe bleeding. So um, yes, um, newer oral anticoagulation are in the market. Proper dosing is important, and the patent drug is used for now. One thing important thing is that in guideline 16 uh, about atrial fibrillation, aspirin is out for any uh, risk score. This is very clear. I think all the young uh, youngsters should know, and uh, the teachers should know that aspirin is out. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuti. I just wanted to mention that factor 10 A SA is available at AKU. Yeah, it's not routine. It's not routine. If you ask me, the, the, way, the way people are prescribing, <coughs> you know, it's, it's actually meant for low blood with heparin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know that. Okay. Okay. It actually doesn't show you the activity of the Yes, that, that's the yeah. other problem. 10, 10 A. 10 A, yeah. It does give you the activity. There's a range of this. Yeah. Uh, less than 0 0.2, between 0.2 and 0.5, and more than 0.5. So there is a range. It may not be applicable to oral uh, no acts, but it's applicable to, let's say, the select The anti factor 10 we use routinely for all the patients that are on non, um, uh, sort of patent no acts. Uh, we check it because we have a very, uh, so, you know, Asha Kamal is a very busy stroke person, and so we get a lot of young patients whose only finding for cryptogenic stroke is uh, APCs or frequent atrial ectopy on long term monitoring. So you get stuck with what we're doing, and, and so we routinely put them on uh, NOAX, and, but we check them seriously, uh, seriously to make sure that they Does that they're increase the cost then? Um, well, uh, the, the local NOAX are not that expensive, no, but we check it. We will be checking it. I mean, this is what I mean. I would rather give the answer then. Because well, Relto, I think, is 9,000 a month, yeah. and this cost is not no, as much. How much is the screening cost? Uh, it's not 9,000 a month, it's less. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next speaker, Dr. Najib Basi. Dr. Najib Basi is a certain cardiologist, Lara Khan, in South City. So we'll be talking about the multi slice Okay, I've been told 15 minutes, and after that, we'll be talking. So, I'll just give you a minute. 
thought that we know whatever we can. So I'm talking about cardiac CT, uh, clinical applications, and any and recent advances. Um, we're um, all well aware that CT, cardiac CT is now there to stay and it's one of the forerunners in cardiac imaging because not only can you detect coronary anatomy but you can actually do functional assessment and hemodynamic assessment with the more recent advances in cardiac CT. Um, what is well established is non-contrast cardiac CT uh, where we um, check the coronary calcium score for global uh, risk assessment um, for um, management purposes and contrast CT looking at coronary anatomy uh, and, and other parts of the heart for specific reasons. So um, those are the, um, the workhorse indicators, but then you have recent advances in cardiac CT and the most recent advance and very exciting advance is actually assessment by cardiac CT of uh, patients undergoing uh, transcutaneous aortic valve replacement. And then of course we have coronary CT perfusion, which hasn't really taken off very well for different reasons. And a new modality, which is not available in most parts of the world, but is just there to be mentioned, is called FFRCT, which is assessment by computational flow mechanics um, of the myocardial ischemia uh, for patients who are in the intermediate uh, coronary risk categories. Before I go any further, we are all aware that the CT scanner has progress from the 16 detector row to the 640 detector row and the scan range has improved from 60 to 160 millimeters, breadth the whole time from 30 seconds to less than half a second and the radiation dose from 15 millisieverts down to 2.46 millisieverts. Um, this is just a consensus statement for coronary <coughs> calcium score and as you know that uh, it is uh, very important to assess what is a global risk estimates for coronary disease and this can be actually checked by checking the coronary calcium score. And when you do the calcium scoring, there's a very nice table here which helps you to decide when to start a statin if the patient does not fall in the usual category for statin um, you know, indication based on international guidelines. So if your calcium score is zero, your risk is very low. So statin is not recommended unless, of course, the LDL is extremely high, more than 190, or if you have familiar hyperlipidemia. If your score is 1 to 99, it means you have a mighty increased risk of coronary disease where <coughs> statins are indicated. If your score is between 100 and 299, you have moderate risk, and therefore statins plus aspirin. So the myth of using aspirin for any person over the age of 50 doesn't apply, but if you do a coronary calcium score, and if your score is high, that means you already have coronary disease. And last of all, if your score is extremely high, then of course, you know, you already have coronary disease. So you have to be on the whole gambit of treatment. So how does coronary calcium score change or shift your intermediate coronary risk status as based on the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease estimates? If your score is zero, you shift this way, become low risk. If your score is anything above one or 100 or 200, you shift into the high risk category. And if your score is, if you're already a low risk patient and you do a calcium score, if your score is raised, then you all, you'll jump into the intermediate category. And this is just a registry of uh, patients who have an annual event rate. Uh, patients who have little or no calcium, the event rates are less than 0.1%. This is the MACE, uh, major adverse cardiac events. And those whose high risk event rate is up to 1.6%. When you do a coronary angiogram, you must have some pre-test probability for assessing why you're doing the test. If your patient falls in the intermediate category based on age, sex, symptoms, typical or atypical, then you can justify doing a coronary angiogram. If you're a high-risk patient, uh, generally you should go straight for an invasive angiogram. If you're very low risk, there must be a strong reason for um, going ahead with a CT angiogram. Indicate indications for CT angiograms, I can't go through the whole lot because of the lack of time, but it's essentially to look at patients who have chest pain without known coronary disease and patients who have new onset heart failure in the absence of known prior coronary disease. Pre-op assessment for patients undergoing cardiac surgery, which is non-coronary. 
And those patients whose exercise test is negative, but they have ongoing symptoms, or they have a Duke treatment score, which is in the intermediate category. And then you have patients whose stress emitting modalities are discordant or equivocal. These patients should be considered for a CT angiogram. New or worsening symptoms in a previously normal study, a CT angiogram. Bypass surgery, <coughs> only if you're symptomatic, should you do um, graft assessment. Stents, very low indications. Unless the stent is in the left main or in the, on, or in the graft, uh, the yield is not very good. And that size of the stent has to be at least three millimeters or more. And, you know, the other indicators as well, right at the bottom is the new kid on the block. It's a TAVR assessment with CT angiogram. So here is a, a, a good algorithm which has now been adapted by the European Society of Cardiology. If the pretest likelihood is intermediate, you go ahead and do your CT scan. If it's low, you still do your EC exercise testing. If it's high, you proceed with invasive angiography. No absolute contraindications other than pregnancy and IV contrast allergy not amenable to treatment, pre-treatment. I won't go through the preparation, but you need to bring the heart rate down using appropriate medication. Beta blockers, calcium blockers, and even evaporidine helps to reduce the heart rate. And when the patient has gone through the scan, you must be careful about how much radiation you are exposing the patient to. There are different ways to cut down the radiation. These are unfortunately not followed in, in this part of the world, but you do have newer models where you can cut down the amount of radiation exposure to the patient going through the CT angiogram. And this is a, a quick uh, axial slide um, showing your joint axis, aorta, pulmonary artery, and the left main artery, LAD, had some disease. The right is coming up here. It has a mild plaquing in the proximal segment. So this is a still prim of the same thing, axial plane. It's got disease in the LAD artery there. You can look at it in other frames after um, different uh, post-processing procedures. Looking at the sagittal and coronal plane, then you get an image of the heart in different planes. And this is a multiplanar format showing clearly <coughs> normal arteries. Okay, now vulnerable plaque. This is a very important concept which you must understand. A plaque is a plaque. It can be a bad plaque, it can be a good plaque. Bad plaque, plaque has certain characteristics. If it has any of these two characteristics, it is a vulnerable plaque which has uh, prognostic <laughs> indications or values. So if it's hypoattenuated plaque with calcium, spotty calcification. There's a plaque which is low attenuation from, surrounded by an area of higher attenuation called the napkin ring sign. Positive remodeling, there's a formula for assessing that if it's more than 1.1, indicator of uh, increased plaque burden. And if your plaque has a low attenuation of less than 30, it's a uh, low attenuation plaque. So this is a plaque in the proximal, uh, the osteal LAD, mixed plaque. This is a soft plaque in the LAD artery here. This is a uh, positive remodeling. This is another plaque in the RCA, again positive remodeling. Now this is a study which shows the characteristics of plaques. Hard events on the X and Y axis is the time frame. And survival rate, patients who have stenosis, less than 50% have a good survival, more than 50% not good survival. Plaque, if it's a non cassetic plaque with uh, no positive remodeling but low attenuation, your survival rate is not too bad. As you get into positive remodeling, the survival rate drops drastically. So prognosis of, of CT angiogram, um, for, of CAD with CT angiogram depends on the type of segments involved and the number of segments involved. This is a the confirmed registry in 20,000 patients, showed over 2.3 years median follow-up, 347 deaths with patients who had these parameters. So this is a high-risk plaque in the proximal RCA, LAD, <coughs> and the mid complex. Now this is a quick case. This is a mid uh, proximal R LAD severe stenosis. And uh, this is an angiogram which shows um, a good correlation. Excellent for assessing graphs, disease, 
and post graft disease. This is a lima graft which is patent, but you can see it's running very close to the sternum, so this is very good information for a surgeon who wants to do a renal bypass. And these are patent lima graft and vein grafts. Uh, this is another. This is a vein graft which shows tight proximal stenosis, and you make out uh, it's a good correlation with an angiogram there. Tight vein graft stenosis. Stents. Um, as I said, indications are few. Um, LED stent, well, the best site for a stent to be picked up is in the left main or in the vein graft. And, you know, you can interpret the lumen in most cases <coughs> in these two territories. And the size of the stent matters. The bigger the size of the stent, the better the re reproducibility of the results. So this is a stent in the left main. And uh, on the right is an angiogram showing that uh, the stent. Let's, let's jump to the TAVR. Role of TAVR, it has rapidly advanced using CT angiograms and uh, transesophageal echo. It's a uh, great value in detecting aortic morphology, sizing the aorta in different dimensions, and the analysis, and helps you to decide whether this patient is going to develop para-aortic regurgitation. It also helps in uh, determining you know, procedural planning, angle prediction, left main height, depending on the type of uh, valve that is going to be implanted, Dr. Fahim uh, is going to talk about it soon. Um, and it also gives you an idea about the coronary anatomy, which patients you should deal with uh, straight away without further ado, or those patients who need to be first. Excellent review of the coronary of the distal arteries. Um, you know, this patient has got bad disease in the LEX, so the uh, interventionist would rather not go to that route. Post-procedure follow-up, this is uh, an example of a valve placement, and you can make out good alignment. Um, and here you see the short axis view of the same uh, valve. Now this is an interesting study. This shows hypoattenuation areas in the leaflets of this valve. And this actually means this patient has got thrombus developing on the valve leaflets. And this is another view showing the same problem there. It was put on anticoagulation and it's all cleared up. So CD perfusion is a very promising technique um, and it has added a lot of weight to uh, simple CD endograms. A lot of diagnostic, non-diagnostic studies have improved just by adding in CD perfusion as a modality. So it increases the diagnostic accuracy from 61 to 87 percent. Uh, now, we may know that there are so many stress modalities available. You know, a stress MR, <coughs> stress echo, spectrum, spect perfusion, PET perfusion, so on and so forth. And these have all been well validated. And however, none of them can provide you anatomic information and hemodynamic and functional assessment in just one test. And that's the advantage of CT perfusion. Uh, you know, there are some disadvantages, the amount of radiation which is being used. Um, but that can be taken care of if you use prospective gating or reduce the amount of uh, contrast used for a CT angiogram. <coughs> okay, so um, I won't go into the technique, but this is um, patient CT angiogram shows a severe stenosis in the circumflex vessel. And this is the resting image, and you see there's a normal blood flow based on the color mapping. And post stress, there's a decrease in the color flow indicating. Uh, circumflex disease, uh, ischemia. And this is uh, uh, a spec thallium which shows disease in the um, circumflex territory and here you can make out uh, there's you know filling defect over there. So this patient has got circumflex ischemia. Okay, so now we've uh, managed to reach the end. I'm glad to say that um, the last interesting topic which is really academic for all purposes, but it's worth talking about. It's interpreting results of, of coronary CT angiography derived from fraction flow reserve in clinical practice. Does it have any meaning at all? We don't know. But it's based on some computational uh, models. Um, and there's a lab somewhere in, in the USA, either it's, it's in Nevada desert, or it's in San Francisco, or it's someplace. But even physicians in the US don't know where this data is transmitted and how they come up with the diagnosis. 
but basically it's, it's based on invasive fraction flow reserve estimates to determine if a patient's coronary narrowing is uh, significant or not based on what the number is. So if your FFR is more than uh, 0.8, then it's okay, you don't have to proceed with angioplasty. If it's less than 0.75, it's a definite indicator of ischemia. In between is the gray zone. There are at least three prospective trials which have shown the diagnostic, diagnostic accuracy of FFRCT using invasive as a reference. And the reporting per vessel sensitivity was 84% with a specificity of 86%. In the platform study, in the diagnostic and invasive arm, guided by FFRCT, resulted in a calculation of 61% of previously planned invasive angiograms in subjects with, uh, with coronary disease, and these patients at one year did not experience any adverse events. So what does it look like? Well, this is a CT angiogram. Um, and you can make out here that there's an intermediate lesion in the proximal LAD with a soft plaque over there. And when this data was um, fed into the computer, it gave you a model which shows that the FFR is 0 0.90, which means this is uh, fine. So this patient was managed medically and one year had no events. And this is a patient with chest pain and uh, had a CD angiogram which shows mild disease in the proximal LAD and severe diffuse disease further down in the course of the LAD vessel. When you do the computational analysis, downstream the uh, FFR CT is 0 0.80, which puts this patient in the intermediate group. This patient was managed medically and at one year there was no problem. So, so we've come to the end of our talk. Uh, what is the take home message here? Coronary calcium score for for us is an extremely important test. It only costs five to six thousand rupees, considering the cost of other tests uh, that we do on a routine basis, and it gives you a lot of information about assessment of global cardiovascular heart disease risk. It influences, at least it influences me and astute physicians as to when to use statin and aspirin in those patients who are intermediate risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. There are clear indicators for coronary angiography, well-established indications. Uh, we see a lot of patients coming in for a CT angiogram with absolutely no indication. And it's been ordered by somebody, so it's done as a routine. <coughs> Excellent for assessment of graphs. It saves time. You use a total of 90 cc's of, of contrast dye. But in one shot, you get a look at all the coronary, uh, the grafts, and the distal vessels. And for coronary stents, as I said, the indications are very limited. Um, so I think we've managed to meet the job. Yeah. Any questions? Thank you. We have this privilege of uh, getting the CT and Jordan free of cost for our patients. And I think, like uh, Najib said, two modalities where I use it a lot and it comes out very useful is calcium scores. Especially in female patients, in whom uh, even uh, non-invasive testing can sometimes be inconclusive. Uh, calcium scores can be very useful. And uh, the other thing is, of course, uh, graph studies. I think graph studies, uh, uh, CD angios, also is very, very helpful because sometimes in diagnostic coronary angiograms also you miss graphs. But on CT and you, everything comes out pretty clear. Um, yeah, I guess the to that case. Before, this is something that uh, in the, the latest slice guidelines, interestingly, uh, for the CT angiogram is the first test to be done in a patient with chest pain because it's free over there. So maybe, uh, you know, we can uh, bypass all the stress echo and stress talions and uh, send all our patients to you for CT angiogram free of cost. Uh, but uh, again, if I can just say to the uh, in symptomatic patient, calcium score is not a good test uh, because it's a screening test for asymptomatic patient. I just 
In symptomatic patients, even with zero calcium score, there is a small percent of the patient who have obstructive CVD and you can miss that. In fact, I did a CT angiogram last week with a patient who came in with chest pain, 35 years old, calcium score zero, he's got some tight proximal osteoanalytic disease. Yeah. So I think if it's symptomatic, it should be a CTA, yeah. and if you're screening patient for risk stratification, it should be checked. Okay, so the next topic is quite interesting. Um, it's like a children? Okay. It's a tabby or tabby, whatever you may call it. It's the right choice for Pakistan. Smart Fahim is an international <laughs> cardiologist at Stress Joint DKU recently. And is the director of Structural Heart Disease Program at DKU. Smart, good luck. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dhaka. And uh, Salam Alaikum, good afternoon, everyone. It's an uh, honor to be here. Thank you uh, to Dr. Saj Dhaka and the leadership at Indus for inviting me and um, allowing me to speak in front of uh, a lot of esteemed faculty uh, that I've heard about. And I don't know if you remember, but I spent a week uh, rotating with you in cardiology at AKU and that sort of uh, set the seat, so it's, we've come full circle here. Um, so I was asked to talk about TAVI and is it the right choice for Pakistan? And uh, I think 15 minutes is uh, more than enough time to uh, show the guests uh, it is the right choice. Uh, so my only disclosure, and so the objective of this is to review essential data, uh, challenges and outcomes specific to our region, uh, review a little bit about the program at AQH and how we could use this technology to meet the needs of our population. So when we jump into class catheter valve therapy, um, we're basically looking at uh, balloon aortic valvuloplasty, which has been around for a long time, and then uh, class catheter valve replacement or implantation. BME is now mostly have gone by the wayside and are used either as a bridge to therapy or bridge to surgery or used uh, more in palliation. So aortic stenosis is a worldwide problem. Uh, the data on Pakistan is uh, clearly limited. Um, uh, it could be either congenital or acquired. Uh, and when mean gradient of the aortic valve is over 40, uh, the peak velocity over 4, value of less than 1, or DI of less than 0.25, uh, that's when you have, uh, most of the time, that's when you have uh, severe aortic stenosis. Um, in the Western world, it's uh, the most uh, prevalent uh, valve disease. In our part of the world, obviously, rheumatic heart disease takes uh, takes over clearly. And uh, there's clearly an age correlation. The older you get, the more the chances that you develop severe AS. So when you look at survival in uh, severe AS, um, clearly there's a latency period until you develop the cardinal signs of shortness of breath, uh, chest pain or pressure or syncope, and then the survival drops off dramatically. Um, and so there's been excellent therapy that's been around for it for a long time. Surgical aortic valve replacement has been uh, the standard of care for, uh, for decades. Uh, patients do well at high volume centers in good hands. The mortality and morbidity should be less than 1%. You can either go mechanical or, or tissue valve, and there's a host of choices uh, that's available. But when you look at the spectrum of patients that have severe AS, uh, so you have lower intermediate risk, which is by far the large proportion, and then in white you have high risk. Um, you have the inoperables and then the ones who are too sick who won't benefit from any therapy. So, so the, the need that was there was what do we would do with the inoperable patients because clearly they have a very high mortality. And then what do we do with the high-risk patients because the, we are operating on them but they have, they have long hospital courses, a lot of morbidity post-operatively. So the need for some sort of lesser invasive therapy was always there. And, and TAVI or TAVI is just uh, meeting that need. So around a third of the patients that go that have severe AS are thought to be unsuitable for surgery. Um, the incidence is increasing as patients are living longer. Uh, the elderly patients especially do not want to go through an open heart surgery and sternotomy. Uh, and people generally prefer minimally invasive therapies. So the two main technologies that came up are um, the Edward Sapien valve, which is balloon expandable, and Medtronic core valve, which is self-expanding. Um, and both excellent technologies, well studied, as I'll show you, uh, with excellent results, uh, but very different technology. Edward Sapien is balloon expanding, stainless steel, steel frame, 
um, is bovine by guardian. The sheet size now is 14 to 16 French. And very versatile valve. You can put it in through the leg, through the subclavian or axillary artery. Transcarotid cases have been done, uh, direct aortic, transapical. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a versatile uh, valve. Medtronic Core Valve and their latest platform, Evroot R. Again, excellent technology, uh, very different. It's a nitinol self expanding frame, porcine pericardium, 16 or 18 French sheath, and again, federal subclavian or direct aortic access. Um, so, for the core valve or Evroot, there's gradual unsheathing, which allows the valve to flower and take its shape and become functional right away. Uh, very rapid pacing and balloon expanding deployment for the S3 uh, Sapien 3 valve. They sit very differently at <coughs> the aortic root, so the core valve or Evro makes contact at the annulus as well as the ascending aorta. Uh, it's a large uh, tubular structure with a supra annular leaflet placement, so the functional valve now goes above the annulus of the aorta, but that's, which has its advantages as well. But you do end up covering the coronary sinuses. So in, if, you, if, if you have somebody who needs future coronary intervention, then it becomes somewhat challenging to get into the coronary osteo. And there are case reports where patients have presented post-core valve or post-evolute with uh, acute MIs and have died because they were unable to access or there was left main or RCA dissection because of the challenge of getting into the coronary. Um, Otherwise, uh, if you uh, look at the annulus, most of the time the aortic annulus is not round, it's elliptical, so that does not affect the function of the valve over here because the leaflets sit above the annulus, and so that's a dis is this clear advantage that this valve has. Uh, the sapien sits at the level of the annulus, it's a shorter uh, sort of stocky structure, uh, doesn't cover usually the ostea of uh, the left main or the right coronary artery. Uh, but does, it's balloon expandable, the deployment is much more traumatic. So if you have a highly calcified aortic annulus, you always run the risk of annular rupture. So both of them have their advantages and disadvantages, which make them suitable for one patient versus the other. Um, so this is the main guiding principle for patient selection for either for surgery or for transcatheter AVR. So based on the STS score, um, you have greater than 8 is high risk. Uh, anything greater than 12 is generally considered inoperable. Uh, 4 to 8 is a intermediate risk and less than 4 is low risk. So I'll quickly go over the trial data and, and so partner B was the index trial came out in 2011 and it was very exciting for everyone compared inoperable patients with uh, transcatheter AVR and, uh, and TAMI clearly did better. Um, in terms of overall mortality, mortality uh, cardiac mortality, uh, stroke, everything was lower with TAMI uh, and the number needed to treat was 3. So a dramatic uh, absolute risk reduction in mortality compared to medical therapy. The next one that came out was uh, cohort A, which was high risk patients. So these were patients that could go for surgical AVR and, and, and did, and the other half was randomized to, to tally. And um, the results were excellent. They were comparable to surgical AVR. Uh, there was no difference in, um, in patient outcomes at two years. Uh, transcatheter valves did have more paravalvular leak, but there was more bleeding and atrial fibrillation for surgery. And females had a mortality benefit in the TAVI cohort. When you go up to two years and look at the gradients and valve areas of these transcatheter valves, they're comparable or better to surgical uh, aortic valves. And um, the next one that was studied was intermediate risk with the safety valve. And the overall patients, which included transfemoral as well as alternative access patients, there was no difference in mortality again. So in the intermediate risk patients or STS 4 to 8, transcatheter valve patients did as well as surgical patients. Important to remember that these are some of the highest volume surgical and cardiology centers in the world, and you're doing these procedures in the best hands. So here, with experienced surgeons doing the surgical AVR, the transcatheter valve was comparable. When you tease out the transfemoral population, it gets really interesting because, as you can see, the TAVI transfemoral arm did better than surgery in the intermediate risk patients in terms of overall mortality or disabling stroke. So it was transfemoral TAVI in the intermediate risk is superior to surgical AVR. Core similarly had excellent results. The high risk population showed a survival benefit with TAVI. Um, there was more pacemakers with TAVI, but surgeon, surgery had more bleeding, more stroke, more atrial fibrillation, and more kidney injury. 
at one year where the core valve uh, survival was excellent, stroke risk was low, pacemaker implantation was a little on the higher side, but they've addressed that and those numbers have gone down. And again, when you look at core valve hemodynamics, the out to one year, the, the gradient across the valve is less than, is in single digits. There's no severe pelovibrary leak and very rare um, uh, moderate pelovibrary leak. And so core valve was also studied in the intermediate risk patients and what it showed was comparable results, similar mortality and significantly reduced the risk of stroke. So transcatheter valve in this population, in intermediate risk with core valve, had less stroke as compared to surgical aortic valve replacement. So I'll quickly go over this. Uh, the Notion trial came out which was from uh, Norway and compared surgical randomized patients to surgical AVR and, and transcatheter valves. And they interestingly looked at structural valve deterioration, mean gradient greater than 20 or greater than 10 from baseline, or new or worsening moderate to severe prosthetic aortic regurgitation, and then looked at non-surgical valve deterioration, which is moderate to severe patient prosthesis mismatch or moderate to severe PVL. And the results again favored TAVI. Um, it showed that structural valve deterioration was much less with with TAVI than it was with surgical AVR, 26.1% versus 3.9, and this was significant. And then when you look at um, the valve, there was clearly more um, structural valve deterioration in the surgical arm out to five years. Non-structural valve dysfunction, so patient prosthesis mismatch, was again worse with, with surgical valves. Moderate to severe PVL was worse with transcatheter valves, so clearly uh, that's an issue that we need to address. There were no episodes of clinical thrombosis and endocarditis rates were lower with transcatheter valves as well. So if you look at all the trials that have been done, we've been going downwards on the risk continuum and the results for each of those trials have favored TAVI in one way or another. And now we're down to the low risk population and those trials are ongoing and I think we're all eagerly waiting for the result. So current uh, ACCHA guidelines uh, say that for low risk surgery, you sh low risk patients, you should do surgical AVR. That's class one. Intermediate risk, you could do surgical AVR or or TAVI. TAVI is a class two way currently, but I think the next iteration is going to change that. High risk, you could go either way, surgical AVR or TAVI. And prohibitive, there is only one option. So when you look at this risk continuum that I showed you before. Just the lowest patients now are, is a question of how well they do with transcatheter valves. Everything else is, is fair game and there's a lot of data to show that the transcatheter valves is superior to surgical valves. So a little bit about the Asian perspective. So our patients get their first surgery or sternotomy at a much earlier age. Uh, Dr. Shahid Sami actually published uh, this data not too long ago that showed that the age, uh, first, first cabbage and for males is 57 and females is 58, which is way lower than the Western population. So if, and a lot of times at this uh, level, moderate aortic valve disease may not be addressed due to cost issues or to concerns for coumarin follow-up and, and adherence. So a lot of patients would come back who've already had a cabbage and now have aortic stenosis. Um, we have tons of congenital heart disease and valvular disease and these patients end up getting tissue valves again because of issues with Coumadin adherence and, uh, and compliance. So you have young patients who have degenerative bioprosthetic valves and valve and valve is a very doable, safe, uh, durable um, therapy for these patients. And, uh, so, and the only sort of good sense for a prevalence of AS in our population is there's an, Indo, uh, there's an Indian echo study that uh, studied patients uh, all covered and the AS prevalence there was 7.3 percent. So uh, our challenges, uh, low uptake uh, in the Asian population despite 4.4 billion of us live in this continent. Only about 10,000 cases have been done across Asia, uh, 6,000 sapiens, 4,000 core valve um, and uh, the the challenge is a lack of funding, high cost of devices, uh, lack of uh, infrastructure, um, there's no structured training programs, and then anatomical challenges. Half the population in our cases ends up being by cuspid. The calcification is tons and uh, smaller root sizes. 
And so what are the challenges to starting a program, its cost, uh, lack of regulatory body, uh, institutional operator and surgeon requirements, uh, diagnosis referral, uh, the concept of uh, having a heart team and, and post-procedure care. Uh, so, and lastly, a documented outcomes or registry that is uh, as nationwide. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to run down and So I think uh, from the data that I've showed, transfemoral tag is comparable or better outcomes than surgical labia in the high intermediate risk patients. Um, this goes both for the safety net and for the core valve. Uh, it reduces length of stay, risk of major bleeding, and atrial fibrillation. Um, the need is there for regional centers of excellence. Um, I think that's the only way you can guarantee care. Uh, you need to have a heart key model. Uh, all of the patients at AQ are, are evaluated by an international cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon. Um, it needs to be a nationwide outcomes registry to make sure patients are done appropriately and that you have good outcomes at these centers that are doing it. Um, I don't think cost is the biggest obstacle. Generally, somehow, through third party, uh, through welfare, through uh, different sources, cost we are able to meet. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the challenges, but it's not the biggest. I think appropriate patient selection uh, and getting their appropriate care with exceptional outcomes is, is going to remain our challenge. And uh, that's something we have to ensure as this new technology uh, gets into our, uh, our part of the world. Thank you. Because we have more on TAVI from the thing that's been in the next session. Okay, I think uh, we have done about 50 TAVI cases at NICBD. And the price is really not an issue anymore. The price has been really dropped significantly, especially on the core valve. And uh, it's about one fifth the cost of what it used to be. So my request is everybody should get involved. And more and more we will use, the more cost will come down. Which was the biggest hindrance in starting uh, TAVI. So I think. I, I think uh, the title of your talk, I, 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 I don't think you've addressed it. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, yeah, certainly the clinical results are comparable, maybe even better. Uh, but, you know, when you come into the idea of value based healthcare, which I think in third <coughs> world countries is even more relevant than the West, than the, you know, value to the patient, value to the healthcare system, and value to the society, then I think cost becomes an issue. Uh, I mean, Nadeem is right, the cost has come down, but it's still, uh, at, at current reduced cost, it's still four or five times the cost of surgical ABR. Uh, and yes, the money is coming from somewhere, but yes, someone is paying that money. And, and perhaps, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are other ways of utilizing that money in a, in a more cost effective way. Yeah. No, I, think I, I think it's a lot of wonderful thought and a lot of debate about it. I think clearly there's. Um, uh, patient selection is, is, like I said with my last point, is key. Uh, but there is clear data now that in certain patient populations, your outcomes with TAVI are better than surgical ABR. And so, yes, cost, if the outcomes are completely comparable and equal, then cost should be the deciding factor. But I think first we have to figure out what the best therapy is and what the patient's chances of getting a safe, a durable result is, um, and I think transfemoral tally in, um, in in centers that are doing them frequently uh, can produce better results than surgical ABR, especially in our population where everybody is hypertensive, diabetic, um, you know, they've got some kidney disease, uh, and really, uh, we don't have uh, quality of life or cost benefit analysis for our part of the world, which is something we're working on now to try to figure out. Uh, what the impact of surgery is uh, financially on a patient on, and on their family and, and whether um, something like this technology actually in the long run turns out to be beneficial. So I think clearly it's not, you can't translate all the data from over there to, to Pakistan or the Karachi, but um, 
you can't argue with the fact when there is lower mortality, lower stroke risk, uh, you know, it's, that's what you have to go by. Well, can I also add, uh, I think the argument is just cost, just for us as information, because this was his argument when we started this program. So I can assure you the cost of TAVR in, in that someone is paying it and ICBD is less than a surgical sample at a private hospital. It's less than 5,000 US. So if, I mean that's the yeah, reason I, why that is... I, I know it for a fact that the core valve is 1.5 million rupees yeah, right so now. Yeah. Uh, at at, at the bar, you can get a surgical valve for about 400,000 rupees. So we can... So that's the, about the, four or five times. Yeah, yeah, and then that's just the core valve. The disposables and everything, it's... Uh, so that's the cost at Tapa. So the reason why I'm no, saying no, this no, is no, that we... we no, no, we, no, Nadim, you know it's 1.5 million. No, it's I not. We, we, pay, we pay less than 5,000 US. So the cost at Tapa is because you're not doing it. If you start doing these things, we started with 35 lakhs, and now we are down, the cost is they're offering us a value for less than 5 lakhs. So this could only have happened if you were doing it. If you're not doing it, then the cost will come down to two and a half lakhs in the next year. So I think that's the that's the key point that to you have to be in the game to be able to manage the game and to be able to play the game. So the you have to be uh, so the key here is to have centers that coordinate and deal with these companies on a coordinated basis because otherwise, uh, as we deal with them individually. It's uh, they're always at an advantage, but if we coordinate it, have centers of excellence, have registries, then I think they'll they are looking to come to our market. You know, like this is where uh, all the patients are. This is where the healthcare needs are the most. So I think we can manage a lot of these issues. Thank you. I, I think just a point. I think I, I still check. I mean, what Asad is saying, I think there's a lot to think about it because what we are talking about is not the effectiveness of the strategy, but uh, it's a national perspective you have to take up. We are here uh, treating individuals, so it's not a national healthcare program where priority set that what needs to be done and what cannot be done. So that's the problem. So I think uh, there has to be discussion on this point. Unfortunately, because government which should be doing it is not doing it. So someone else who should actually be talking about it. Okay, I think it's been so that I so you to take coffee period of time even. <laughs> so, uh, well, I'm the last speaker between now and coffee, so I'll try, I'll go fast to this. Well, the reason to present this is to uh, make you all aware what Indus Hospital is all about, what cardiac services we are doing at Indus Hospital and what our future plans are. And I think Dr. Bari is here so he can add up to if I miss out something. This is Indus Hospital. Most of you uh, have been over here at Indus Hospital. Both Gundi is in Kurangi, right? Very close to Defence and Clifton. Uh, very approachable place. This Indus Hospital started back in 80s and 90s. It was Islamic Mission Hospital and uh, I think started by Dr. Kazi and then somehow for some reason it didn't work and uh, then Dr. Bari and his team came in and came as a, as a Rufeda Trust and Indus Hospital Trust and acquired in the early 2000 and then it became Indus Hospital. So this is what Indus Hospital looks like right now. The idea of Indus Hospital was that we will provide free of cost services to the people of Pakistan. Not only people of Karachi but people of Pakistan. A very visionary concept, very unique. Uh, uh, so the journey started from Indus Hospital to Indus Healthcare Services and 10 years later now it's Indus Healthcare Service. The, the question was, the big question was, okay, if it's going to be free, then where's the money going to come from? Where well, money is going to come from? Charity. Whatever you can call it, it's going to come from a charity. So many people were skeptical about it, including, I should say, myself was very skeptical. And I think today is, till, till today, Many people uh, question me when I go to, you know, socializing events, ki, Are, kaise chale ga? Oh. and I think the credit goes to this individual, Dr. Abdulbari. I think it was, uh, I think, really impressive that he, the way he, I think he had, he's a person of very strong faith and optimism. He worked hard and uh, he achieved, I think, what he wanted. A very unique concept of having a hospital which is free of cost for the people of Pakistan. So the hospital started in 2000 and slowly and gradually one after the thing added to this. Uh, we started our cardiology services back in 2008. That was the first time we started doing and the 
graphies and geoplasties and biopsies and I'm really honored that Dr. Bari asked me to do the first one. Or so I think that I think it's not going to last long. But I'll show you the data that in 10 years what we have achieved. So anyway, so we focused uh I started to do those arts later when we came to those are chora. We started a cardiology fellowship program. And uh, so we started also focusing on the academics and then we straight trained uh, a fellow who is now currently working at the Arkin Hospital with Dr. Imran. So in this hospital in Maniswath, you have almost all services available. This is a non-invasive cardiac services. We have almost everything which uh, should be there except for the nuclear and the CT and all of those fancy things, the cardiac MRI. And that's because of lack of space and I think that's because of lack of funds. But that's never been a problem and I think Dr. Bari has never looked back into it. We have currently two cardiac cath labs at this hospital. We're planning to have a new building coming up with six cath labs. One dedicated to EP, one dedicated to PEATS, and then four for adult services. And uh, this currently these two cath labs are almost all basic things that are required. Ivers, rota, all of those things. And we have done a lot of cases over here. We do almost more than a thousand angiographies a year, free of cost. We initially we started over here uh, with the Kapontek as a company. But anyway, somewhere in 2008 you can see down below, okay, we started, Dwaza Barame what we had was a, for the full time cardiologist, so the, so the volume doubled to 500, 600 a year. And then 2016-17 uh, we trained two international cardiologists at Indus Hospital, uh, Emmanuel Noor and Imran. And they really have very itchy fingers, so suddenly the volume doubled to, you know, thousands. So, in the, we put in a few pacemakers, we are a part of the pacemaker bank, JOK, uh, which is a, funded by APCNA, we had a few pacemakers every year. A couple of AICDs, a few AICDs have also been inserted by, uh, by our colleagues who came from North America and inserted. So, in the past 10 years, we have done 10,000 cases at Indus Hospital and all free of cost. I think that's a remarkable credit to Dr. Bai. Our inpatient volume has been in thousands. What's more impressive that we see 10,000 patients a year, every year in outpatient clinic. And the way outpatient clinics are designed in such a way that now the waiting time has reduced to almost a day. So you can walk in and uh, we can be seen by a cardiologist right away. Cardiac surgeries has been a little sore point for us and that's because we don't have a full-time cardiologist yet. And but, but hopefully this year we plan to have a full-time cardiologist so we can, cardiac surgeon, sorry, so we can increase the volume of our cardiac surgeries. So the idea of the speech of cardiac services is to have a pediatric cardiac surgery program and I think the Dr. Manaz Atik is here. She has been helping us since 2000, I think 12. 2000, no, 2012, yes, 2012. And in the past five years, she has been a regular feature. I think hats off to her. She comes every Saturday. She does, she sees patients, she does echo, she does intervention. And recently, she implanted this first pulmonic bus. That's uh, another thing. Uh, we plan to develop our arrhythmia and EP service and then the vascular imaging thing and a preventive cardiology service. So the idea was to have this uh, state of art comprehensive accessible free cardiac center for general public. This is the first of the future goals of Indus Hospital is to develop a 50 bed hospital. I think now it's 1700? 1700, yeah. With a 150 bed emergency room uh, so that outpatient clinic that is going to be designed in such a way that 5000 patients are seen every day. A specialized individual centers of excellence, a school of medicine, school of public health and paramedical training. Well, I should comment over here that we already are training paramedics right now. Well, our first batch of paramedics, our technicians, is going to graduate this year. And four technicians and a doctor, uh, uh, Professor Azamullah Kunti is in charge for that. Uh, we have a school of nursing and we have ambulatory care facilities in this new world. This was a groundbreaking ceremony in 2013 and that's the model that's going to be in existence in the future. This is the construction underway right now. And this is how Inshallah is going to look like, a really beautiful hospital. <laughs> Indus uh, Hospital has uh, moved in the past 10 years from the concept of Indus Hospital to Indus Healthcare Services. 
and uh, it has acquired uh, 14, 14 hospitals, I think? 12 hospitals. 12 hospitals, yes. 12 hospitals across the country, mostly in Punjab, but I think one in Badin, one in Peshawar. And uh, most of them are funded by the government, a few are funded by the people. Uh, it's missing two campuses. Uh, one campus currently, which is in Muzaffar, which is in Muzaffargarh, is, is has started cardiac services. And there's one expected, and that campus in Muzaffargarh is um, we plan to start international cardiac services by the end of the year. And there's one hospital in Lahore, which is coming up, which is going to be the Indus Hospital Lahore. And that's also be a fully functional cardiac service as well, right? This is the um, the data from the past few years. What's impressive, I think, the, there's a slide missing from the bottom right-hand corner, which I was impressed to see. In 93% of the funding is from Pakistan, from the people of Pakistan. <laughs> the concept was because, and 7% only is the expats who transfer money in dollars. So I think a remarkable contribution by the people of Pakistan towards uh, Indus Hospital. And I think most of you are sitting over there, and thank you all. Uh, if Dr. Bari, if you have any comments to make, you're welcome to come. Sorry. Any comments, anything? So I think we just need a coffee. Okay. Dr. Bari? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm very uh, fortunate to have uh, good people with me, team. Sajid started and then as a volunteer for a few years, then and came in. Dr. Manaz with us. Alhamdulillah, it has been, as uh, Sajid said, it has been the firm, the Bunyad of Indus Hospital is the firm believe in Allah Ta'ala. And people used to, when we were starting and people used to ask me, 99.99% told me that uh, you can make it, but you cannot run it free of cost. And I was given one month, six months, max one year, and people said, in one year's time you will be charging people, patients. We are 10 years old now. Not a single patient has been refused because of the of money. And it started with a million dollars a year. Official budget now it is 150 million dollars a year. Official budget. And Sadi missed one of the important aspects of our, uh, one of the directorates, which is uh, the directorate of Global Health Delivery. So we do a lot of public health program that is, uh, we are principal recipient for uh, TB and malaria from Global Fund. And we are running a grant of about $47 million, uh, which is ending, uh, which ended uh, uh, this year in December. And we have been uh, given <coughs> another $50 million for TB and malaria across Pakistan for the next three years. And we are starting uh, family medicine clinics across Pakistan and inshallah this year we'll be, we'll be having 20 family medicine clinics across Pakistan and till 2020 we'll be 50 and we've been uh, given go ahead by the board to have 500 by 2030. Inshallah, uh, hopefully it will change uh, the health status of Pakistan. Thank you very much and I'm <laughs> thank you very much and thank you all the team. And it's a teamwork which we do. And Indus has provided an umbrella for visionary people to come in and achieve their good mission. Thank you. A specific reason for <coughs> your outreach program, the Outdoor Province, is there a specific reason for that? <laughs> <laughs> Very uh, good question. Basically, uh, it is uh, the funding and the delay. Uh, we were. Uh, I, as I understand, there are several projects at Indus Hospital that are funded by Sindhya. Several different projects going on at Indus. They are funded by 
We were, uh, we, we were the, the Sin government was the first to enter into a private-public partnership with, uh, in this hospital. And we signed an agreement in uh, 2015 with uh, Sin government. And uh, the in Badil hospital was supposed to be handed over to us in one month's time. It was contractual obligation. But it took a year to take over that hospital. And we submitted the budget, and unfortunately, uh, we had to uh, bridge finance about 20, 20 crore rupees. And it took us about two years to get the fund. And uh, we were asked to take over the new new facility of uh, Badin, which we have. And since last seven months, we are waiting for the funds to come. The day before yesterday, I went to the Minister of Health. Another two weeks ago, I had a meeting with the uh, CM, uh, Principal Secretary of the CM, and he was very uh, gracious to help me out. He called everyone. That this fund has to be released in a day or so because that hospital has to be operational in 15 days time but no action. So day before yesterday I went to second uh, Mandir Saab and I told him he said being 15 days going in and out and no action is done. We called the chief minister and told him that I am resigning because it was my project with these people and I can't continue with this. Then uh, the chief minister already had because uh, the input was given by the principal secretary to him. He already arranged a meeting uh, yesterday at 10.30 a.m. and he asked the finance department to deliver the site before Juma Pairs. And we got the fund before Juma Pairs. But after Juma Pairs I was told not to deposit that account, uh, that <laughs> check, because <laughs> they wanted to do uh, some mechanism. Hopefully, that will be done on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, my, my services are always available. Yeah, they're to going to say they have been there. On your board, so. well, I've always been there with him. No, no, no. I've, I have several no, no, times. I have. Whenever I have. he's required my help, I have been there. Uh, uh, un unfortunately, uh, we have a full support. Uh, I was told by the uh, by the uh, chief uh, principal secretary in the Sunil Rajput about two weeks ago that there is a there is a, a standing instruction by the chief minister Singh that any request from Adi Brisbane, Dr. Bari and Dr. Nadeem Kamar, you don't have to ask me, execute. But in spite of that, <laughs> you have to so there's something on your part that's not right. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get some funds from it. I have to be the one. I have to be the one. Okay, I will come over to the service. Okay? We'll take a coffee break and then we'll meet. We have three set, uh, presentations after this, so we can... Let's have a quick coffee. How, how, how long is your coffee? Ten minutes. Uh, how fast can you drink it? So, <laughs> I think we'll start at the after the break session. Next speaker is uh, Dr. Asad Patan. Asad, uh, everybody knows Asad. This is an introduction. Is, uh, Asad is going to talk about mechanical pharmacology of the patient, current challenges in Pakistan. And uh, again, we have 15 minutes. Dr. Mansoor Ahmed, uh, in a panelist. I'd like to thank Sajay and Bari has left and the remaining organizers for uh, inviting me as long as to everyone. So, uh, you know, uh, Sajay had called me, I guess, nearly six weeks ago 
but my we are the what is right now <laughs> so uh, and i said to him ke uh, my my bias here is i'm an international cardiologist so obviously the presentation is geared in that direction ke what are the challenges i faced in uh, in the cath lab doing stem pci uh, and ke uh, uh, why uh, के पी सी आई जी की हम बात कर रहे हैं या री प्रोफ्यूजन थेरेपी तो दिस इज सिक्स मंथ सर्वाइवल आफ्टर हॉस्पिटल डिस्चार्ज इन ए सी एस एंड इफ यू लुक एट द रिस्क रिडक्शन तो ये ये एक्चुअली सर्वाइवल इंप्रूवमेंट दिखा रहा है या रिस्क ऑफ डेथ दिखा रहा है तो इफ यू सी द बिगेस्ट जंप इज फ्रॉम रिवैशलराइजेशन एंड स्टेनी में तो ये थोड़ा सा और भी ज्यादा है नियरली थर्टी सेवन परसेंट इट्स इट्स पी सी आई बट इट रिवैशलराइजेशन या I should say reperfusion therapy, and that's the reason why uh, the rest of the talk is actually geared towards this. The goal of reperfusion in STEMI is to restore flow in culprit artery, optimize myocardial perfusion, uh, preserve the IV function, diminish complication, but most importantly, to improve survival. And uh, you know, my two friends, both of, both the Nadeems were here. and uh, i think a lot of credit goes to them for increasing the availability of semi pci in the city and the rest of the uh, uh, province but i think uh, today i will be stepping on their toes despite this uh, and i'll i'll go over the reasons for that so time to reperfusion steadily has a, has a big impact and this actually it's a complicated slide and and this shows odds of ratio of fibrinolytic therapy Uh, above the line pci better and below the line uh, fibrinolytic better and what's important is ke agar if this delay to pci uh, the benefits of steady pci go down and when you're close to about 2 hour delay for steady pci it's no better than lytic therapy in fact it actually becomes worse so this is very important ke the time to uh, reperfusion therapy that this is not something we should a uh, brush under the carpet in the you know in the excitement of doing pci so what are the reperfusion challenges uh, i i think this this most of these apply to across the world but some of them may be unique to third world countries uh, i think the biggest one here in pakistan is lack of reperfusion therapy or access to steady care uh, delay in reperfusion time uh, bleeding complication how to tackle thrombus burden no reflow lack of critical care cardiology reperfusion injury lack of lv recovery despite epicardial reperfusion stemi with multivessel disease uh, i think it's getting more and more confusing with this and how to take care of patients with stemi and cardiogenic shock so lack of reperfusion therapy and access to stemi care what are the numbers or incidence of stemi in pakistan there is clearly no data available uh, european is 750 to 1250 stemi per million population us is somewhat similar uh, in india they estimate the number is closer to 1500 to 2000 per million uh, but again it's just an estimate i just put in for pakistan maybe somewhere in between uh, india and the west 1000 uh, to 1500 per million and again there is a debate on what's the population of karachi but uh, it, it still works out to anywhere between 20 to 30000 stemi just in karachi alone uh so that is a big number uh and and uh, access to semi care this is a slide from the uh, just uh, presentation at tct uh, data from india and, and i think a lot of similarities uh, so two registries uh, create and the kerala registries and um, nearly large number of uh, acs patients and if you look at that at uh, 20000 acs Uh, and 34% of them were from STEMI. This is different from the West. US data is close to 20-25% STEMI. I looked at uh, Tabba ACS registry 2017 before coming here. We had 3,000 patients with ACS at Tabba in 2017, and we had a STEMI number of actually 37.5%. So much closer to India than than the West. And uh, if you look at uh, uh in in india access to stemi care so she could be economic strata if you look at lytic therapy coronary angiogram pci they divided it by rich upper middle class low middle class and poor and you can see that there is still a, a big lacking over here 
and overall reperfusion therapy was only in about 60 to 70 percent. Um, in, in our uh, TABBA 2000 database, that number is about 83 percent patients who got uh, lytic therapy and had STEMI, but again, keep in mind it's a, a cardiac only referral sector and we're getting different kind of patients. I, I don't think that data is representative of general hospitals or, or what happens in the rest of the country. So what are the roadblocks to STEMI care? Lack of dedicated STEMI care systems, uh, lack of instant, instantaneously available ECG facility at first point of medical contact, lack of public and patient awareness, lack of physician readiness, uh, lack of equipped ambulance system network for patient transport, and I think a big roadblock is self-pay for everything. Um, at, 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 um, you know, every institution is different, but at Tabba, it's, it's close to 85 to 90 percent of patients who come to Tabba pay out of pocket. Uh, so very, very small minority has third-party payers. Uh, and it becomes a, a big issue. So for countries like Pakistan, where, or even if you look at Sindh, where driving distances to STEMI centers will most of the time be more than 90 minutes. I think acute STEMI PCI cannot or will not be the answer to every single STEMI in, 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 in Sindh and Pakistan. Uh, and, and clearly there is a role for pre-hospital lytic therapy. Um, in again, looking at India, I keep repeating India every time, I think there are a lot of good things we should look at. They have started making their own TNK. Uh, TNK is one of the thrombolytic agents and the advantage of that, it's a single bolus. Uh, so you give it in, in 15 to 20 seconds and the lytic is done. Uh, and they have shown now that if the patient with uh, uh, symptom to needle time of less than 30, uh, sorry, three hours, they're getting re successful reperfusion of more than 90 percent, which I think is an outstanding number, and it's something to think about. So, uh, you know, single bolus lytic therapy, and then shifting to a PCI-capable hospital for angiogram and PCI, which is in the current guidelines within three to 24 hours. I think perhaps is a model which might be more suitable for a uh, third world country or, or certainly countries where they long driving distances. The only I think one or two countries in the whole world where they are offering 100% primary PCI. I think Poland is one of them. Uh, and it's all because these countries have short driving distances and, and, and access to STEMI centers very quick. And then a combination of strategies with direct PCI and facilitated PCI is required. Um, and integrated STEMI care model with a hub and smoke model where you have emergency ambulance system with ability to perform and transmit ECG, uh, personnel able to assess the patient, uh, automated algorithm for lytic availability, uh, eligibility, symptom duration, travel time, and then pre-hospital lytic therapy I think uh, will play a big role. So STEMI India model, they, they try and achieve a door to needle time software which automatically decides uh, what should happen to the patient uh, and statewide some kind of third party payer insurance system uh, to uh, optimize that. The second challenge we I think we face is delayed reperfusion time. And I've, I've already gone over it both, but both with lytic therapy and primary PCI, uh, the longer the time to reperfusion therapy, uh, the higher the mortality. Uh, and so clearly time is of essence in these patients. Uh, and the relationship between time and myocardial salvage and survival, if you look, most of myocardial salvage happens in the first three hours if there's reperfusion. And uh, the median US symptom to ER time is two hours. Uh, 2017 Tabba Heart Institute, this number is four hours. Uh, not median, but mean, and I'm sure median is not too far off from there. So much longer than U.S. The patients, when they come to uh, institutions in Pakistan, the, the delay is much longer. And if you look at it, the, the most of mortality benefit is also is during uh, this time. Uh, and in, in the U.S., with the Door to Balloon initiative, the, the uh, door to balloon times have gone down dramatically, but if you look at the in-hospital mortality and 30-day mortality, it's been pretty flat now for the last decade or so. So clearly, I think you can only go a certain period, and I think most of this revolves around uh, the ischemic time. Uh, 
this is again the same data from uh, Tabba PCI database 2017. So last time we did 676 TEMIs within the first 24 hours and uh, this is showing symptom to balloon time. So patients who had less than 2 hours or 2 to 4 hours or 4 to 6 hours and more than 6 hours, you look at the mortality, it's clearly going up. Patients who come in and get a PCI within 2 hours of onset of symptoms, 1.7%. And if you're beyond six hours and, and majority of the patients are falling here, it's going up to nearly 10%. So I think this is something which we really need to work on. Uh, patients are not aware of uh, what the symptoms of myocardial infarction are, or they ignore symptoms, self-medicate, consult a GP rather than go to an emergency room or non-physician. Lack of trust in doctors and healthcare system, extended family support system. I think this is a major problem, and the reason why patients come to the ER, they are having a STEMI, and you tell them this is required. Whatever, your patient comes from an office or something, they are alone, uh, and no immediate family member, and we cannot get consent and you sometimes one, two, even three hours are wasted and it's very frustrating for the treating doctors. So this really does become a problem in these situations. And clearly public awareness about MI symptoms, importance of time, seeking immediate medical attention and, and reaching an appropriate STEMI care facility is very important. Uh, not only just lectures, print media, TV, internet, social media, I think even um, they're doing it for cancer, so why not for MI on cigarette packages? I think start putting in MI warnings and MI, myocardial infarction <coughs> symptom times. And you know, a lot of these things need to be done in our setup to try and uh, reduce this problem. Uh, moving on to another problem, we see uh, uh, no reflow phenomenon, which we, although we get immediate uh, verification in the cat lab, but this happens with lytic therapy, this happens in bypass surgery, it's just that it's not recognized in those situations. And what happens is that you fix the culprit area and you're still not able to restore normal flow. And, uh, and the ECG will show persistent ST elevation. Uh, you do cardiac MRI, you would have one, one uh, uh, parameter which they look at is microvascular obstruction, which showed that you don't have perfusion at the tissue level. Uh, and this clearly, if you have angiographic no reflow or MRI microvascular obstruction, clearly the mortality goes up. Uh, so it is not a good thing to happen. Uh, I won't go into the details of mechanism, they're not truly well understood anyway. Uh, treatment again, it, it's a big dilemma. There was a small study uh, published with intracoronary streptokinase. Uh, this is in conjunction with uh, STEMI PCI. They showed better reperfusion, but clearly has not become practice. Uh, they, they tried where they use adenosine nitroprusside. Uh, in this one trial, they showed some benefit uh, with ST resolution and angiographic microvascular obstruction. Uh, but there's another trial subsequently done using MRI, and they actually showed no benefit. In fact, if anything, myocardial salvage was actually worse with uh, uh, adenosine and nitroprusside versus not doing anything. This is prophylactically uh, treating. So uh, again, no reflow is a difficult problem to deal with, but causes uh, difficulties. I'll try and quickly finish. I think a major problem I see is lack of critical care cardiology not recognized. We're still functioning down here, uh, whereas we, we a lot of institutions. I don't think there's a single institution in Pakistan which has a CCU or a, a cardiac intensive care unit which is capable of doing all, of, all these things, which is what we need to be doing for some of these very sick patients. Uh, data from South Korea showing that if you do have a close a, a cardiac intensive care unit uh, with, a, with a cardiac intensivist on board, you do reduce mortality. Uh, this is when they implemented in 2013, both intensive care and hospital mortality go, went down and progressively kept going down. Uh, we tried to get one of our uh, junior cardiologists trained at another institution in their critical care program and uh, despite multiple efforts, uh, they would not take him on board uh, uh, perceived as a, as a competitor. 
So I, I think a lot of challenges in those things. Uh, and then STEMI with cardiogenic shock, that's the last thing. Uh, this is again Tabba mortality from last year. If you look, uh, even though Caleb class 3 and 4 are only 10, less than 10% of our STEMIs, they account for nearly 60% of our mortality. Uh, and, and our mortality has been consistent for the last five years, anywhere between 45 to 50 percent for STEM, uh, st uh, cardiogenic shock and STEMI. Uh, there were some new guidelines just a couple of months ago. Uh, I'll, I'll just quickly go through this, but uh, 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 mechanical circulatory support, the only uh, uh, device available in Pakistan is a balloon pump and uh, the randomized data shows that it doesn't really help in this situation. Uh, and this is uh, from one of the presentation paradigm shift uh, of, of mechanical uh, circulatory support. We're still in the pre-2007 era. There are a lot of these devices, none of them are available here. Uh, Impella, I understand, came in, but the price was about uh, 3 million rupees. It's a one-time use disposable item single patient, I think 3 million I, uh, is, is cost prohibitive in Pakistan. Uh, outcome data, there's still some debate about whether it helps uh, any of these devices, but uh, there is some suggestion if you put it in early on, before opening up the artery, you might get more benefit. So in, in conclusion, there are a lot of challenges. I think some of them are specific. Uh, I didn't even put in there, this is talking about stemory perfusion. I think a bigger challenge is actually getting or preventing patients from actually getting to a STEMI situation. So we're talking about primary and secondary prevention. I think there's a huge lacuna over there, not much focus on it. Uh, I think physicians seem more focused on doing intervention uh, rather than uh, taking care of the patient. I know these are hard words, but uh, I think, again, food for thought for a uh, lot of doctors. Thank you so much. Sorry I went over time. Uh, I think excellent review. Uh, I think that's that's actually the reality. Uh, I think our data at AKU is not very different from what you have shown. And uh, the worry is that my feeling is that probably a senior time, which we are now seeing, is about four hours plus, is actually much longer than that because uh, the results we see are not. I mean, show that they probably if they come very late. So because I think the the, the perception of or counting the time or distance in our population is not really very uh, strong. So, I mean, maybe when they are telling us the time, the time is when they actually had very severe symptoms and they missed out a lot of time before that. So, uh, so I think that's a very, very relevant point because door to balloon time is not now an indicator of how the outcome is going to be. It's going to, it has to be this senior time. And second point, I think we have to work on a STEMI care program, not just a facility for primary PCI. Until you have all the parameters together, I don't think it's going to make a benefit to, to the population. Yeah, well, I, 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 yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful presentation, and I think you have uh, pointed out the relevant details. Uh, I think when it comes to lytic therapy, and the kind of streptomyne that's available, it, is it really worth it? Because uh, T and K is not available, and whatever is available is too expensive. Uh, we should emphasize on a good thrombolytic drug to be available over here. Otherwise, I mean, for a mass population, you cannot, at least in near future or foreseeable future, you just cannot provide. Uh, um, but I think that's where uh, uh, government and national healthcare policy comes in. And as I said, K, TNK in India, they managed to do it indigenously. Uh, if they can do it, we can do it. But I think this is where the government has to step up. And there has to be a national approach to it, or maybe even a provincial type approach rather than, uh, you know. At the same time, I think uh, the cardiology community should be aware of it because I've noticed that we keep waiting. When, I, uh, when they tell me the money is being arranged or they're talking and I don't get it, they actually refuse. Yeah. They refuse the therapy and they refuse to get transferred to another institution. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, I agree very frustrated. It's a very serious issue. 
and, and I didn't get time to focus on, I think, critical care cardiology. I, I find working with my colleagues, I think that's a very big problem in our cats because the sick kill of three, kill of four patients, the glucose off the chart, acidotic, the, the kidneys not working, they need ventilation, and that's where you need a, 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 a critical care person who's, who's a cardiologist. And I think that is the need of the time now, and we need to train people and get that on board. I, it was the end of the talk, and I was getting uh, messages, I need to stop it, but I think that was a very important uh, component of I think basically, this Basically, you are a lonely king over there. You have to deal with everything, and that's where the serious problem is. You have no helping hands around. If somebody goes into the talk, you really have to deal with that as well as everything else. So that's very right. I think we need a team. Okay, uh, I think moving on the same theme of primary PCR and CAVI. In the past uh, couple of years, there's been a lot of primary PCR has done in, uh, at NICVD. Nadeem just left, but we have Dr. Professor Nadeem Bisri. He will be presenting the data from NICVD <coughs> regarding uh, primary PCR and CAVI. Right, I think you need to listen to this with an open mind uh, because a lot of questions that were put down. Uh, by a lot of you will probably be answered. This was, I was called not six weeks back, but just six days back, so I have modified my uh, presentation, and this, uh, this was a TCT presentation initially, and I've been invited to present this data at another American STEMI forum, so I've modified this. So I'm just going to go quickly over, over so no really financial, dis uh, one financial disclosure. So NICVD is a 680 plus bed tertiary cardiac hospital just for the people who don't know. It's a semi-autonomous uh, and the new administration under Dr. Nadeem Kamar took over in February 2015. And we started an initiative to rehabilitate the hospital, build new infrastructure and provide free cost of services to the people of Metropolis in the province. And primary PCI for all was started on the 15th of May as the flagship uh, initiative. I've been shouting, so I joined NICVD in 2000 and Asad was my colleague and from day one I've been shouting that it can be done. So initially it was not free of cost and we were uh, supported by a donor, but the, the objective was to provide the state of the art care to the local and the provincial population. So in the first uh, two years, <coughs> out of uh, 14,000 elective angioplasties, we managed to do 9,058 uh, primary PCI. This is the two year data that we had. Initially it was thoroughly scrutinized. So essentially we also put in some chest pain units. We are going to have around 20 to 25 chest pain units in Karachi. At the moment we have five which uh, are called CPUs. They are manned by doctors, ca cardiologists, they have ECG, defibrillator, a technician and a nurse. And we've had around 20,000 patients present uh, within the last three months to these uh, CPUs out of those 11,000 have been non-cardiac and we have picked up around 1,500 acute MIs in these four CPUs. If you have seen uh, them, they are uh, standing at the various situations. So usually the patient presentation there is between 15 minutes to two and a half, three hours. Um, it takes uh, five minutes, once we come to the ER, it takes five minutes to uh, be transported to the ER, another 10 minutes to be transported. Uh, to the cath lab and the average time in the cath lab we've uh, figured out is around 50 minutes. We usually discharge our patients on the second day or the third day and they are followed up in the OPD um, uh, in, a, in an interventional clinic on the seventh day. So this is our data. <coughs> in the first two years, this it started on 15th of May. First six months was at a cost of $750 which was subsidized by a donor. Um, but since January 2016, it's free of cost. Only FDA approved stents are used, DAS or BMS at the discretion of operator, and all data since 2000, January 2017 is uploaded on the NCDR. So the total primaries, the first, uh, between six months in the first year was 2,172. Uh, in 2016, we did 4,016. In uh, 2017, last year, we did 5,857. So the total primaries done uh, between May 2015 till date is around 12,045. These are just at NICVD, not the satellites. The total mortality first year was 5.9%. Uh, in 2016, it was 6%. In this last year, it had gone down to 4.2%. 
and this again as Asad said is basically related to shock patients. So the cumulative mortality is uh, 619 patients have died in hospital out of 12,045 angioplasties that, that we've done which is a cumulative mortality of 5.1 percent. On 21st September, uh, this is just the data of those, we had 29 primary PCIs within the first 24 hours which is I think some kind of a record. Okay, the demographics pretty as much 75 percent male and the age group mostly between 40 to 65 years and the clinical risk factors as expected, very few dyslipidemics as you can see uh, according to the criteria, mostly hypertensive, diabetics, some smokers. Uh, again, the median time that we have for these 12,045, and this is calculated by a separate statistician and research department, is 75 minutes. Um, between, as you can see, around 20% patients present, more, these are the outliers, more than 90 minutes takes to do. There was some kind of consent problem or some misdiagnosis or something. So these are the patients who present and then take more than 90 minutes for them to have uh, uh, PCI. So most of the, if you take 75 percent patients at least, we, we do it within 60 minutes. But the median time for these patients is at the moment 75 minutes. Uh, again, about a third is a single vessel and the rest, is, if you can look at these 12,000 patients, 5 percent are left main with three vessel disease and these are the ones that uh, constitute our main mortality and these are the patients in shock. So uh, about nine, uh, 85, 87 percent are without heart failure and about uh, 13 to 15 percent patients have some kind of heart failure, 5 percent are shock. Patients left main stenting outcomes, the ones that were in shock, this is the shock type, I mean the mortality is around 40 percent and these are the patients with left main among these who we've done left main and with triple vessel disease with critical left main presented with an STEMI. <coughs> So we are success rate which consists of ST segment resolution and TME3 flow is around 93%, uh, partially successful 4% that is TME2 flow and unsuccessful cases around 3% for this data. So the satellite program, government, semi-government NGOs are handing over hospitals new and old with relevant facilities and comp equipment to NICVD based on a five-year MOU. NICVD is to have full operational and management control and to provide the same level of services as at NICVD free of cost. And we started with primary PCI and we're going to have echo and pediatric at the same time and then follow up clinics and then preventive cardiology in the second phase. So Karachi, here's Karachi. We started Larkana. We've done Tandu Mohammad Khan, we've done Hyderabad, done Seven. February 14th, we are going to have an ICVD 350 bedded hospital in Sakha. Then uh, Nawab Shah and Khairpur. And then Mithi in 2018. The drive time, myself, I have driven all these places, is two hours between Karachi and Hyderabad at the moment. Two hours between Nawab Shah and, uh, and this is on the national highway. Another two and a half hours uh, and then another hour. So we are actually and then two hours here. So we've planned this in a way and in between these satellite centers there are going to be CPUs where as I said we if the time is being spent on transportation if there's any delay we are going to have TNK. We've already planning to and we've already arranged all that so and there's no problem in having TNK all over and we're going to have a single bolus TNK those that are going to take more than 90 minutes for transportation. So this is all in plan. So essential prerequisites for what my view is and this is what I focused on and this is why I think we are being part of trained manpower, trained manpower and trained manpower. You don't need anything else except trained manpower. We've got 40 post FCPS cardiology fellows at four levels. So basically the train map at NACVD we've got a faculty of 26, the professors do the 6 to 12 in the morning and then as they become, uh, as you go down the chain, uh, the senior registrars uh, do the midnight to 6 a.m. sessions. There are four consultants or six hour shifts uh, from different units, all four hospital units taking in patient for six hours each day at different times. 26 interventional fellows uh, at two level, uh, level P1, P2 means first year, they are called the junior fellows and then P3, P4 senior level. There's a one consultant, one senior fellow and one junior fellow goes on a one week rotation 
uh, to each of these satellites uh, and the future plan is that 18 out of our 80, uh, 10 out of our 18 graduating fellows who have already graduated have opted to uh, stay permanently at these satellites. So they are going to remain there after the completion of training. So these are our satellites at various places and this Sakhar hospital is the large one. Uh, diabetes half and half. Uh, five mortalities, uh, three, uh, two related to cardiac mortalities, three related to non-cardiac uh, uh, bleeding, etc. One out of hospital, four within the hospital. And this is the general comorbidities, uh, etc. And we've had the data, if you want, I can share it with you later. And this is all done by statisticians in our thing. And, you know, generally, there's nothing much to, uh, you know, to for it to stand out as against whatever international things are. Our success rate is pretty okay. The extent of course we have left main disease, we try and fix them uh, or coronaries a uh, week before uh, uh, we do the TAVI. And uh, we've had uh, embolization, valve embolization in a live case. That's the only one we had where the valve embolized and then we had to put in another valve. And we've had uh, about four cases where we malpositioned the valve and had to put in a valve in valve because the core valve tends to in bicuspid goes down. Uh, and complication rate again, uh, you know, nothing uh, different from the international data. The mortality, as I said, four in hospital, one at home, readmission rate. We do follow them up and there's a marked improvement. Uh, there's no limitation in, uh, in about 70% of patients and there's still about one patient out of those 39 patients that I've presented. This is the data for 39. The six that we've done recently are not in this data. And there's one uh, late stenosis that we had to put in a valve in well. So in conclusion, TAVR is safe and effective. Uh, indications for TAVR are expanding. Cost of TAVR will decrease as indications and volumes expand. The Pakistani population deserves to have locally available expertise in selected tertiary cardiac preference centers. Thank you. Anything to the patient, but obviously there's a cost. So, what's the cost of a primary PCI? Uh, the equipment cost is, I mean, it's not taking, we never calculated the electricity, etc., etc., but with the equipment cost is around 69,000, 59,000 rupees. No, uh, what I mean is, I mean, I think total cost, which is <coughs> training, manpower, and all. No, we have, we've not done it. You see, the, the point there is be, that. There should be a cost analysis to see, I mean, what actually does it cost. Yeah, I mean, the, there must be, the, the, the people are probably doing it, but for us, the service is more important than the cost. I mean, how do you, how do you assess the relative cost of the, the amount of money they give to health? I mean, cost has to be ascertained against a barrier that you say that this is the amount of cost that is worth it. So how do you put that in a Pakistani perspective? I mean, you, USA, yes, they say some sort of dollars spent on something is equal to whatever. In Pakistan, there is no such thing. When you're spending so much on defense and other things, then what is the cost of, that's why health and education are down there, because we keep on arguing about cost. I mean, what's the cost in Pakistan that you are worth, you are ready to spend on saving lives? I mean, 800 primary PCIs in Larkana, people ask me what were they doing? And I mean, obviously, some of them presented late, some of them you're not saving lives, but I'm sure we've saved at least 50% of those patients, my guardian. But I think the point is not with the money is spending. The point is, can you benefit more people with the same money? That's what the whole debate is about. Yeah, that's so, so, you, so you're very right that in Pakistan, uh, I, I don't know, I think it's yeah, 1% or even less than that on healthcare budget. Uh, even work, Bangladesh is doing like over 2% or something. Pakistan in the region is the lowest uh, in health and education. So the, the debate is not that. The debate is... But that, that little money, can you benefit more people? Yeah, just, just, just follow us and, and the budget for health will keep on going up and the parameters. Will, and let me tell you something, this is free for the patient and, and the physicians are charging. Paise to paise aare. Paise aare na, government ke aare, wo paise, paise, no, 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 no,
because that is a public health issue, the cost. Yeah. Actually. So yeah. please, that's not my get, if, the, if the data is available, then yes, we can discuss about the cost. Uh, and yes, I mean, this argument, what Asad has said, this much money, where to use it and what to use it, and this is the argument the health departments have always brought up. And they have put down a specialty saying that either storage nahi hai, pani nahi hai, ye nahi hai. I mean, we, we cannot just stand still. We just have to do something about it. And I think it's a great initiative. The more awareness uh, there is, yeah. the government oh, will okay. be forced There's to There's a question from Priya Why did you point it out about the Money and volume. We are paying. We are paying quite a high amount. The fellow gets around one and a half lakh rupees. Plus, he gets to do around 500 PCIs in a month himself, and he gets trained. And then they, we are doing all Pakistan. So people come from the Azad Kashmir. Ka jo aap keh rahe. Udhar kabhi ab hum aaye pas aaya. Wo keh raha tha Mudafakar mein jaake kare. Do saal ki wo training. Agar itna volume hoga, to wo acha he he do well. Zadi, just a quick question. Um, you're doing a fantastic job in both in PCIs and in TAVI. Just one question. There is no data on post-TAVI stroke, number one. And uh, how do you follow your TAVI patients um, clinically and uh, do you have any yeah. results? We have, we, have a, we have a dedicated fellow with each of these who follows them up every week by a telephone call every yeah. week for a month. Month ke under wo do visits karte hain aur wo pure hamare chhe mahine tak follow. I present to you okay. the six month stroke hamare paas abhi tak nahi hua. The which is surprising. The international data is 20. But volume kam hai na. Fifty cases. I think it's probably because we are using younger patients. No, no, no. Hold on. They recently they have done a study on stroke in the Indian population. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
और छह हजार बकिया अस्पताल हो तो बारह हजार लोगों के साल का हार्ट अटैक हो रहा है then I think the cardiologists are just doing primary and people are seeing nothing else. That's, uh, that's, it should be like, मेरे साथ इतना तो वो तूफान में नहीं पड़ते लोग जितना ही ना यहाँ पे। At least twenty thirty percent not reaching the hospital. I think वह जैसे इमरान खान ने कहा कि seventy thousand people died in this terrorism war against terrorism जो हमने fund किए। so it's 30,000 army in Karachi mein aisi mar hai heart attack ke saath to phir to I think we need to rethink all the policies okay the next speaker is Dr. Manaz Ati Professor Manaz Ati Manaz has as I said in my presentation has been a remarkable help at Indus Hospital she has started the pediatric cardiology program and she is going to talk in this session by yeah, presenting what she wants to achieve in the future and what uh, her plans are. Thank you. Thank you, Sajid, uh, Chairperson. Um, thanks, I think, for giving me this uh, opportunity. Um, I, I, was talk, I was told to talk about the pediatric cardiology program and its future direction. I think the vision of uh, um, cardiac care of this program should be to provide the best possible care for infants and children and adults with congenital heart and acquired heart diseases free of cost which is already being done. The center should aim at providing a very high quality therapeutic options within this limitation and this requires working towards a very critical elements, organizational features that would make the likelihood of this occurring. So just to go back, I think uh, Sajid has already mentioned how this program started. We started very humbly in late 2011 with uh, a clinic which had initially very few uh, patients, two, three per clinic, and gradually the patient volumes went up. And then now we have, um, we, uh, because I come only on Saturdays and do it when I'm not on call on AKU, so around 40 to 50 clinics per year and uh, outpatient clinics and similarly it's, uh, the same number of echocardiography clinics and in echocardiography we do pediatrics adults and recently started doing one or two fetal echoes and in the, in the late morning then uh, uh, after cardiac catheterization intervention procedures and in the afternoon I do the clinics. So the numbers over years just a, a rough calculation the outpatient clinics we saw about 3,000 or 3,100 patients and um, the echocardiography before the children's cancer hospital merger we used to do about 700 to 750 patients per year that is around 60 to 70 patients per month but after the merger it has gone up tremendously we do an echo of on 200 patients per month and these were the cardiac catheterization and intervention procedures that we did uh, PDA 92, right heart 48, valvuloplasty 52, aortic coarctation 25, ASD and VSD 15. These numbers uh, actually we could not give a whole variety and we do not do neonates, we do not have a surgical backup. So very selective patient uh, population and very, we are very selective in our case selection. So that uh, we have, uh, we don't end up in complications. I think we just embolized one PDA device and we lost one critical pulmonary stenosis. Otherwise, it was a fairly good success. So this was just a very small service that was started. And obviously, as we want to go, the way forward would be to evolve this or convert this into a program or a center of excellence. And in order to do that, we have to take care of the clinical area, the education, the research, outreach and telemedicine, and obviously have some quality initiatives. And the clinical care area, I just divided into th three components. It should be on the equipment, the center elements, the personnel, and the services. So in the center, we have practically everything in place in this hospital. The non-invasive diagnostic modalities, ECG, Holter. But we do not have, uh, I think we are not doing so much of Holter in children because we don't have uh, an, a surgical uh, uh, setup yet pediatric EP that should come up in, in future. Echocardiography, yes, we have started, but we need more probes, transthoracic, transesophageal and fetal probes. And uh, for pediatric cardiology, we need CT angiography because that's uh, uh, a complementing uh, uh, diagnostic service and cardiac MRI. 
In the immediate thing also pretty much we have things, but we are still using the adult inventory, the cardiac catheterization interventions. So we need to have a periodic inventory, a biplane. If you, if Sajid says we have, we'll have six uh, uh, cath labs in the new building and one will be a dedicated pediatric cath lab, then we should go for a biplane senior angiographic machine because that uh, makes a lot of difference. And obviously if we have a planned thing going on, we should plan and hybrid to it which may benefit both pediatrics and adult population. Again, continuing on the center elements, we should have operating rooms for cardiac patients and uh, pediatric specific cardiac coronary bypass machines and the filtration ECMO program, maybe sometime down the line. And, uh, and pediatric anesthesia and ICU equipment, we should have step down units, dedicated cardiology ward and ambulatory and emergency rooms. So th this will probably make a uh, the whole setup. Then, very importantly, as Ms. Uh, Ministry pointed out, we need personnel. So, we need pediatric cardiologists, a general cardiologist. We don't have um, categories of pediatric cardiologists, unfortunately, in our country because there are so few. So, we have everything rolled into one. So, you do a general pediatric cardiology, you do the non invasive, trans thoracic, trans esophageal, and fetal diagnostics, imaging, and fellowship programs are a big backup and you need and support services from neurology and nephrology for all our post-operative and otherwise cardiac patients also. So the personnel is a bottleneck. And then trained staff. We have a technology, school of technology. So we will have inshallah hopefully in the industry will have echocardiography and ACT technicians and cath lab technicians. Same thing for the imaging room, the pediatric cardiac perfusionists, operating room techni technicians and very specialized nurses to take care of these frail babies. So the services that need to be built up, you need to build up outpatient emergency and inpatient services. Going on on a low scale right now, but for the center it should be on a full scale. Neonatal services. Neonatal services have also started in Edindus with the senior neonatologists and hopefully this service will also take up. Non-invasive diagnostic, many things are in place but need to be improved. Invasive diagnostics again, yes, intervention procedures, uh, only those procedures that are done on very, uh, very small babies or uh, critically ill babies are not done here, but uh, majority of the procedures are being carried out. I think this is uh, one of the bottlenecks of this program and you have to work hard towards getting a surgeon, very few surgeons in the country. So this, whosoever joins, it depends on what level the surgeon has been trained and what he wants to do with the program. You can see he can start with closed heart surgeries, PDA ligations, PDA shunts, PA bandings, co-op repairs, and then move on to more uh, difficult procedures like ASD closure, VSD closure, valvotomies, tetralogy of fellows, and then complicated and complex procedures like single ventricles, DGAs, and so on. So surgeon will, ha will have to step in, and without surgeon, um, this program is not going to be complete. Only we have a pediatric intensivist on in, uh, in this and uh, one of the only the only one in the country, fully trained and I think um, he has to be supported with all the equipment that he wants, the paramedical staff, and so on. So in the end, this is a multidisciplinary team that is required for this program to run. And the pediatric cardiologist, we should have at least two of these, two, two pediatric cardiologists, one surgeon, you can, the rest of them can build up over a period of time, and then uh, a lot of um, paramedical and ancillary staff. So, having spoken of the services and the personnel, uh, you can, I mean, just want to complete by saying that this has, there has to be professional training and scientific research and scholarship to this program. Fellowship training in higher, I mean, every, I think every cardiologist or every senior physician is recognized. One of the recognition features is how many trainees did he train in his uh, era. So I think this is also a very important aspect. That you have to develop fellowship programs and higher training and uh, take out papers and, and uh, make enter, register, enter into registries and databases. Very important is to have differential and update courses for the supporting staff and CNE for professionals. In this point, I mean, at CME, I would just like to add one more thing that since uh, uh, Dr. Sajid said there were 12 centers, or satellite centers, I, was, I happened to speak to some of those uh, people there, and they, ha they are offering pediatrics. 
and their difficulties in diagnosing sick uh, neonates and sick pediatric patients. So I think they should have this particular training in what is called as point of care echocardiography, POC. So they can just learn focused echocardiography, looking at just for the, for example, in the ER, looking for pericardial effusion, tamponade, every function, and the neonatal thing, team looking at family uh, uh, hypertension of newborn versus cyanotic heart disease. So I think this is a very important component, train your satellite and then com communicate with telemedication, telemedicine. So uh, I go with Benjamin Franklin, tell me, when you tell me I forget, when you teach me I may remember, but when you involve me, I learn. So the way forward after this would be, they already have a community program in outreach. The cardiology should go out now. And then I just I said telemedicine with other centers, research and quality initiatives. So the hospital has to invest in this. Where should the pediatric cardiology be located? In the children's hospital or with the adult cardiology program? A big debate. <laughs> so advantages and disadvantages to both. The advantage of pediatric setup, you have the residency program, the residents know the pediatric management, the nursing knows the pediatric management, and you have a very spe special neonatal service. Advantages with the adult cardiology setup, the equipment, the nurses, the technicians, and so on. So, I mean, I don't know. We have, don't want love me, I think, so that's it. <laughs> so, when, but in a center like in this, it's a, it's a it's not an isolated hospital, you know, so you have, you can uh, you utilize both, like we do at Nagasa. We are part of both departments. We are part of pediatrics and we also share so many things with adults. So that can be actually um, produced here also. So I see the challenge. When is the economic challenge? But in this, it is doing a remarkable job, free of cost. I have never been questioned by Dr. Bari or the Dr. Sajid as to how much equipment I have used, how many wires I have opened up, and uh, the inventory amount of inventory I have used. I mean, that I really thank them for this. But um, how can you really uh, uh, economize on your inventory? Can you reuse? We do not reuse at Indus. But I was in Kerala two years ago. They reuse even the perking needles. So when they have, it, and not once, but several times. So every reuse catheter has a date of uh, the reuse and date of re-sterilization on it. So until they can use, they, they would use all that. So maybe, I mean, since you're offering free service, is that a possibility? Obviously, local indigenous manufacturing, like many of us pointed out, I don't know how feasible that's going to be with our government and you need a lot of commitment for that. And then we need more philanthropy which we, and endowment, which we are already, mashallah, getting. Very uh, big challenge is the train manpower. So, and the institution's preparedness to have the vision, to invest, and to retain trained uh, personnel. So I just end up with this slide saying that pediatric services everywhere in the world built up on the back of viral services. But institution's recognition comes from this very small juvenile service. Thank you. I think in the, <coughs> the question of your answer is which is the best way. It's like in NICBD we are bidding up a 250 bed. It is already started a pediatric cardiology hospital just within the premises. So as long as, but you have to have a separate bed with the children, bachche, unke jo logistics are totally different hai adults ke saath. So you have to have a, either within that hospital a separate area or better still are totally separate. Usme ab jo hamara ban raha hai, usme at least six cath labs hain, aur wo charge to hi to. This is something that I think at Indus also you could probably plan within the same. Yeah, they have a dedicated. They plan a dedicated pediatric uh, cath lab and a ward, a 50 bedded ward and all that. In fact, the first funding that we got for a building was for a pediatric. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. yeah. Indus got the first fund for building was in for children's hospital. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we end this session, I think Dr. Bari, if you leave, please uh, hand out this souvenir skill. Thank you. Dr. Swan, Yes, sir, ready? Thank mm -hmm. you.
for coming out with me. Thank you all for being here and I really appreciate your help in coming out. Thank you. Thank you.